Uh, I'm certain that we probably learned it from the news media, as we do many times when th uh, incidents like this uh, occur. And there was uh, White House uh, spokesman Larry Speaks uh, saying that the president watched in stunned silence at the explosion aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger. To recap, about a minute after the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger from Cape Canaveral this afternoon, there was a huge bright ball of fire, an explosion in the air about 28 miles west of the Cape Canaveral launch site. It is not known at this hour the fate of the seven crew members aboard, including Christy McAuliffe, the school teacher from Concord, New Hampshire. The explosion came without warning. All seemed to be going fine about a minute into that flight. It was just after the uh, NASA controllers told the crew aboard the Challenger to go to full throttle that the explosion occurred. It happened uh, oh, more than a minute before the usual separation that you see of the uh, solid fuel rocket from the main part of the Challenger. Again, paramedics and ships are moving to that area. It is not known the fate of the crew, what has happened. Uh, we hope to hear from that uh, very shortly, but obviously it does not look good. Uh, this is the first accident of this time, uh, this kind for uh, quite some years. Uh, three astronauts, you will recall, uh, back in 1967 were killed on uh, the la launch pad during a testing. Uh, they burned to death inside a capsule. Again, we have no word on the fate of the seven astronauts aboard uh, the Space Shuttle Challenger in this accident that happened a little while ago. Let's go back now to Houston and uh, correspondent Dan Molina. Dan? John, I must say the president said he watched in stunned silence, as did we all. Uh, we are going to look now at a recap of what happened as narrated by the NASA commentator, Steve Nesbitt. We had an apparently uh, nominal liftoff of uh, control. this morning at 11.38 Eastern Time. Out of muscle uh, switching there, isn't the ascent see. phase appeared normal through approximately the uh, uh, completion of the roll program and uh, throttle down and uh, engine throttle back to 104%. Uh, at that point, we had an apparent uh, explosion. Subsequent to that, uh, the tracking uh, crews reported to the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle uh, appeared to have exploded and that uh, we had an impact uh, in the water downrange at a location approximately 28.64 degrees north, 80.28 degrees west. At the time, the data was lost uh, with the vehicle. Uh, According to uh, a poll by the flight, uh, flight director, Jay Green, of the positions here in Mission Control, there were no anomalous indications, uh, no indications uh, of problems with the uh, uh, engines or with the SRBs uh, or with any of the other systems at that, uh, at that moment uh, through the point at which we lost data. Again, this is preliminary information. Uh, it's all that we have at the moment and we will keep you advised as other information becomes available. We had, uh, there are recovery forces in the general area, uh, others being deployed, including aircraft and ships. We uh, saw uh, what we believe to be a paramedics uh, uh, parachuting into the uh, impact area. And we have no uh, additional word at this point. Looking at that picture of mission control that you were seeing, uh, I could notice up in the back of the room a gentleman by the name of Eugene Kranz, the flight operations director. I can't help but recall when Apollo 13 had its problem, you may well recall, back when Apollo 13 was in danger of not getting back from the moon. It was Eugene Kranz who sat at the flight director's desk and said, keep calm, we've still got the limb, we can still make it back if we have to. There are people in that room who are used to flirting with absolute disaster, but they may have confronted one really this time gene kranz is the, is way up in the back right hand corner of the of the room where it says flight operations director the uh the crew to recap if you're just if you're just joining us uh consisted of, uh, consists of seven people the mission commander is francis dick scoby a veteran of a lot of flying hours of course uh, of particular concern at this point is the fact that on that shuttle was sharon krista mccullough 37 years old the first teacher to fly in space 
And we'll go back now to John Palmer in New York. Thank you, Dan. We have uh, just been given a new position for the crash site, now 12 and a half miles uh, offshore off the Cape. Numerous ships and aircraft are now en route to the crash site, again about 20 kilometers or 12 and a half miles off the Cape. It's, uh, it's uh, interesting and somewhat distressing to note that the Challenger was not equipped with ejection seats or other ways for the crew to get out of the spacecraft. That uh, was not the case during earlier shuttle flights. The Columbia, for instance, had those, but the Space Shuttle Challenger did not. As we've just seen a few minutes ago, a White House spokesman Larry Speaks came into the briefing room there at the White House to say that the president listened with stunned silence as, uh, as he saw a television replay of the explosion aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger. We want to go there again with the note that we still are awaiting word, of course, on uh, the fate of the seven uh, crew uh, persons aboard. Let's go back now to the White House, though, and check in with uh, Chris Wallace. Chris, what can you tell us? Well, really no information beyond what Larry Speaks told us just a little while ago, that the president, as you say, watched a television replay. He was in a White House meeting in the Oval Office when Vice President Bush and Admiral John Poindexter, his national security advisor, came into the Oval Office and told him that there had been a problem down at the Cape. He then went into a study just off the Oval Office and watched, as all of America is, a television replay and saw that, that terrible accident as the, uh, as the shuttle was about a minute uh, off uh, the uh, liftoff pad. Uh, they have no details, they say, beyond what we know. They have no firm information on what has happened to that crew of seven that was aboard the shuttle. Uh, as for all of us, uh, a, a number of network correspondents and White House correspondents were uh, in a meeting in the Roosevelt Room just uh, across the hall from the Oval Office with White House Chief of Staff Donald Regan being briefed on tonight's State of the Union address, a very normal meeting here, a normal briefing, when uh, suddenly a Regan aide came in with a typed piece of paper. Uh, Regan read it to all of us. It said simply, the shuttle has exploded, details to follow. And as you might imagine, that briefing uh, broke up immediately as uh, the White House officials headed for their offices to get information and as we headed here for the press room. But uh, really, uh, it, to a large degree, we are being told the president and his men are doing what all of us are, which is uh, watching television and uh, listening for authoritative word from uh, Cape Canaveral. Thank you, Chris. NBC News correspondent Tom Brokaw is now in our Washington studios. Let's uh, check in with Tom. Tom? Well, John, uh, Chris Wallace and I were in that same room together when that uh, explosive news, of course, came to Donald Reagan, who is the White House chief of staff. And as I dashed out into an outer lobby, people were saying, has the president been notified? And as Chris uh, so accurately portrayed there, that we now know how the president was notified. It's important to know that as the shuttle leaves that pad, it is really a flying fuel tank with those two large solid rocket boosters on either side of it. And of course, the great external tank that is attached to the rocket as well. It's all fuel as it leaves the, as it leaves the pad. It is a very volatile vehicle, and of course, astronauts have expressed concern in the past that if something happened then, they wouldn't have much of an opportunity. Here's the launch this morning. Let's watch it once again. The grim reality of a major tragedy this morning at Cape Canaveral, the launching of the shuttle. Power. Everything looked normal at this point, and as a matter of fact, NASA officials say there were no anomalies, nothing to indicate that anything could go wrong as it headed downrange. The Challenger has been waiting for about five days to go off the pad. This would have been the sixth day. A number of problems, some of them weather-related problems with the door yesterday, but nothing to indicate the enormity of the tragedy that we're about to see here. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Velocity 2,257 feet per second, altitude 4.3 nautical miles, downrange distance 3 nautical miles. Throttling up, three engines now at 104 percent. Challenger, go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, nine nautical miles. Downrange distance, seven nautical miles. 
the NASA official who was narrating there apparently had his head down looking at telemetry, that is signals from space, because you could see quite clearly there was an explosion. It appeared to be at the back of the spacecraft. We will not know for sure, if ever. At that point, everything is burning. The solid rocket boosters on both sides, and of course the big external tank that is feeding them as well. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. We have no downlink. Obviously a major malfunction. That's the understatement of the year, perhaps, as this shuttle blew up as it was attempting to go into space today, about two minutes downrange. At one point, we heard that it was four and, a th uh, four and a half miles high at that point. There were no ejection seats whatsoever. There was no way for those astronauts to escape. There's been no confirmation on their fate, but of course, it looks very much as if there was no hope whatsoever for that seven-person crew, including two women, and that includes the school teacher, Krista McCullough from Concord, New Hampshire. Her school students and other students at that school today were assembled in an auditorium to watch all of this, tragically. And of course, the teachers began to suspect that something was wrong when they saw what we all saw, and they herded the kids back into the classroom. It will be a, a dark memory for them. Days, and her crewmates treat her like one of the gang. This was a little trek up to break the sound barrier with Dick Scobie, her mission commander. They could have very easily said, oh, you know, there's a teacher, what are we going to do with her? She's going to get in the way, or we've got to plan things around her. If I needed help during the lessons, if I needed an extra pair of hands, I mean, they've just been so wonderful. I, I really do feel part of the crew. For several months now, doctors have been jabbing and probing her, zipping her up in black bags to see if small dark places scare her. She's gone through all sorts of training and shuttle simulators, and she's learned a few cold, hard facts about what to expect. I didn't, I didn't realize it'd be so slippery. The shuttle's small, and if you kind of think of it as being in a maybe a six-man tent with seven people in it, and it rains for six days, that's the environment that you're in. It's all a very big change from life in Concord, New Hampshire. This was the day she left home for four and a half months of training. It seemed especially tough to say goodbye to her daughter, Caroline. Love you. All right. I'll see you later, alligator. Okay, let's get dinner ready. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Life without mother in the McCullough household. Yeah. A new adventure for Krista's husband, Steve, and attorney. Okay. Frozen cook. Frozen cook. Open that thing up. He's doing a super job. I mean, he took over single pairing. Without missing a beat, the kids are doing well, he's doing well. I mean, he's doing so well that when I came home the last time, I walked in the kitchen to do something, and he kind of looked and he said, excuse me, he said, we don't do that that way anymore. I said, pardon me. <laughs> She's part astronaut now, but still a teacher first. There's an elaborate plan for her to teach from space and to hook up a direct link with her old school. Much of the country will see this ultimate field trip, and Krista says it's just the kind of recognition right. teachers need. And because they feel so good about themselves and the morale is high, I'm hoping that other people are going to look at that and say, they do a very important job. She'll earn a place in history when Challenger lifts off. She'll be a celebrity for a while. Then it'll all be over. Krista McCullough will be back in New Hampshire, back in her classroom, but she'll always be known as the teacher in space. Dan Molina, NBC News at the Johnson Space Center, Houston. And it now appears, of course, that Krista McAuliffe could very well be remembered as a teacher who died in space. We have no confirmation of that, but there is no indication that there is any life that has been spotted among that seven-person crew today. McAuliffe's husband, Stephen, and her two small children, Scott and Caroline, were among the spectators at Cape Canaveral today to view the launch, what looked perfect for about two minutes, and then tragedy struck. The ramifications of this tragedy we can't yet realize, of course, this early on, but of course it is an enormous tragedy for the McCullough family, for the families of the other astronauts. It throws into grave doubt the future of the space shuttle program, which has been troubled recently. And of course, NASA will come under a great deal of criticism for this public relations uh, effort that it has been making to get regular citizens into space. There's been a program for journalists that is now under consideration. Recently, Congressman Bill Nelson of Florida completed a trip before that Senator Jake Garn of Utah went up. This program for teachers was announced by President Reagan during the course of his presidential campaign in 1984. Some people believe that it was an effort to win both 
the support of teachers and women in that a woman teacher was picked for the experience. He said uh, in his defense that he thought it would be an effort uh, to share the space program with the children of this country so that teachers could uh, share their educational skills after they have completed this trip. We have nothing further from NASA at this point. For those of you who are just joining us, the Space Shuttle Challenger today blew up about four and a half miles downrange about two minutes after its launch. John Palmer is in New York today. John, uh, do you have any additional information for us there? Not really, Tom. Of course, we're all waiting for the same thing, the fate of the seven astronauts aboard the Challenger, but we do know that three Coast Guard cutters, uh, two rescue helicopters are now on the scene. Uh, the area where the splashdown took place, of at least uh, we don't know how much of the shuttle Challenger was intact when it went into the Atlantic Ocean, but uh, that uh, position is given anywhere from uh, 12 and a half to perhaps 28 miles uh, off the shore. There are no U.S. Navy ships, we are told, in position there, but again, three Coast Guard cutters and two rescue helicopters. And a little bit earlier, we saw that parachute in the sky. That was one of the paramedics uh, bailing out there over the scene. Again, as uh, Tom said, and as we have... Uh, we have heard several times now the explosion took place about a minute or a minute and 15 seconds to be exact into the flight. All appeared to be going well. And then there was that uh, tremendous, uh, brilliant flash, the explosion. And we had two contrails, one going one way and one the other. One apparently the solid uh, rocket uh, dropping into the sea, uh, the other the space shuttle Challenger. Earlier this morning, the delays were caused by the freezing conditions down in Florida. There were icicles, some people said as long as two feet hanging from uh, uh, parts of the spacecraft and there was a there was a condensation problem and they were a little bit afraid and they delayed because this they thought might cause a problem of chipping of some of those sensitive tiles on the spacecraft if they should break off during the launch procedure well the nasa officials talked this over for some time and decided to go ahead with the launch that they didn't think uh, that would cause any particular uh, problem here is a picture of the crew the seven astronauts aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger. Of course, uh, the most celebrated uh, passenger there is um, the civilian, if you will, the school teacher, Krista McAuliffe of Concord, New Hampshire. And uh, there were a lot of reporters were up there this afternoon, of course, for the launch. They were in the high school auditorium with the students as they watched their teacher take off. And then, of course, as all of us that were watching noticed that there was something wrong, there was an explosion. The school officials didn't know what had happened, but they knew something had happened, and uh, they suggested that all the reporters leave and all the students go back to their classes, and that's, that's what happened. There is Krista McAuliffe, the school teacher, who is taking her flight. She was going to, to conduct two one-hour or so classrooms from space and uh, be talking back to, to kids in classrooms all over the United States. The other crew members aboard that flight, along with uh, Krista McAuliffe, the commander, was Francis R. Scobie, 46 years old. The pilot was Michael J. Smith, age 40. Uh, Judith Resnick, also on board, age 36. Ronald E. McNair, 35. Ellison Onizuka, who is 39. And Gregory Jarva, who was 41. That's Gregory Jarvis, 41. All in all, seven astronauts aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger. And again, Tom, we're just waiting here, as you are, for some word as to the fate of those aboard the Space Shuttle. Thank you very much, John. Um, I can talk at uh, some length about Judy Resnick, uh, one of the astronauts that was aboard this uh, ill-fated shuttle this morning. She was uh, one of the first astronauts assigned to NBC News when we first began covering this program. Uh, she was a determined and enthusiastic young physicist who maintained her enthusiasm for the space program even through some long delays. As a matter of fact, I had a note from her recently inviting me to come down and watch this launch because we've had a kind of a running joke about the delays in the shuttle Challenger and in the shuttle program. Judy lives in uh, Houston, Texas. She's given over her life to the space program and it appears today that she may have in fact given her life to the space program. She was one of those people who worked in anonymity really. She was not the first woman to go into space. That was Sally Ride, but Judy Resnick was right behind her and she's a payload specialist. Uh, she has been living in Houston outside the space center now for about the past 10 years going to work on what is a really trying routine for these people who are involved in the space program. It's not all the glamour of the launch day. Long hours, sometimes seven days a week, training in programs uh, for which we may not think as civilians that there will be any payoff, but they know that ultimately that they will learn from it. So it's, a, it's an enormous tragedy for all the families of all the astronauts that are involved, uh, not just the McCullough family. Uh, Dan Molina now is at Houston. Do we know any more down there, Dan, at the Johnson Space Center? Tom, we're just getting a little bit more information. We are told that there is a recovery force in the area 
Uh, they are correcting the distance that Challenger was downrange when it exploded. They are saying it was 18 miles downrange now. Uh, they are saying that there was no, quote, anomalous information coming into mission control at the time that the explosion occurred. That, of course, translates to nothing wrong, apparently. Uh, it occurred short, the, the explosion, that is, occurred shortly after what is known as throttle up to 104%. They throttle up the engines to 104% of their capacity. That is a normal procedure during launch. Uh, and it was at that point that the explosion occurred. Mission control uh, here in Houston has complete control of the launch sequence from the point where the shuttle clears the tower, which is about seven seconds into launch. So all of the information, all of the telemetry uh, comes into here at the Johnson Space Center. They are studying it now. They are telling us nothing more than they couldn't see anything wrong at the time. Obviously, a complete evaluation going on here and at headquarters in Washington, D.C. Aside from that, Tom, we have no further information for you now. I think it might be useful if we showed uh, a NASA animation of what is supposed to happen under normal circumstances now. During a routine separation, what happens is that those two large rockets on either side of the shuttle slide away from it. And the big external tank, which is now orange colored at the back of it, that just breaks up. What is supposed to happen is that those two external rockets slide away and the big external tank breaks up. And then, of course, the shuttle itself goes into orbit. It's really a flying airplane with two short wings on it. Let us show you now a NASA animation of what is supposed to happen on a normal launch. And then the external tank will separate and it will break up. That external tank is filled with a combination of oxygen and hydrogen. It fuels the main engines, which are at the very bottom of the spacecraft itself. They're used for liftoff and then for directional purposes during the course of the flight. And then, of course, they're used once again as they re-enter uh, the Earth's atmosphere for the landing either at Cape Canaveral or sometimes at California at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory today in uh, Pasadena, California, NBC News uh, space correspondent Roy Neal, who has watched a lot of these, and he has watched a lot of, or too many tragedies over the years as well. Roy? Let me first of all say that NASA had planned on everything except what happened this morning. As you know, they had abort modes, four of them, which would handle almost every situation, including, oh, an escape chute down which they could ride off the launch pad. But this, whatever it was, this catastrophic failure was not in the NASA plan. And what it means to most of the experienced reporters here uh, who have been covering this beat and who are here in Pasadena because we've been observing Voyager passing by Uranus. What it means to most of the reporters here is NASA now has to go back to its drawing board. First, it has to find out what happened. And after that, in addition to finding out what happened, what do they do to fix it? The only time before in the whole history of the space program that astronauts have ever been killed in the line of duty was back on what they call Apollo 1. And at that time, the spacecraft was on the launch pad. It was an early version of the Apollo spacecraft, which called for a total redesign. Now, obviously, the space shuttle, having flown a number of times and flown very well, experienced something strange, something that caused catastrophe. Among the reporters here, uh, there was a mood, uh, it was uh, incredible. They were gathered for a news conference that should be taking place in about a half hour a climatic news conference that should have covered all the wonderful things that an unmanned probe had discovered in deep space out of the far planet. Instead, as they watched in utter amazement on their monitors, the reporters saw instead catastrophe at the Cape, an explosion the size of a small nuclear weapon, we are told, because that's about the explosive capability of the external fuel tank when it blows. A small nuclear weapon in space, of course, in actually in atmosphere, but high enough that uh, no one was there to observe it. Enough miles from the Cape that they could see it, but not feel the power of that detonation. There was one chute that was seen, but the observers also know there were no chutes for the crew. No chutes, no escape tower, no way out for this kind of failure. Instead, the only chutes on board were to bring down uh, the solid rocket boosters. And one of them did indeed deploy, and presumably there's a solid rocket booster somewhat burned out somewhere out there in the Atlantic Ocean. But as far as the crew is concerned at this writing, it would seem totally hopeless. And NASA obviously has suffered a tremendous tragedy with the catastrophic failure today. Tom? 
Right, wouldn't you think that the shuttle program now is just going to be on hold for an undetermined number of months? They've had a number of difficulties with the launch of this uh, vehicle before today because of not just weather, but they had problems even with the door handle yesterday. Don't you think that there probably will be a congressional demand and a public demand that the shuttle go on hold for a while until they get it absolutely trouble-free? I would think, Tom, were you and I running the program, that's exactly what we'd do. Settle back, figure it out, determine what has to be done, then do it, and then start all over again. I don't know how deeply this accident will impact the program. I think that remains to be seen, subject to engineering studies. It has been a troubled program, of course. They've been hoping, they've got four of these vehicles all together, and they've been hoping to put them up on a regular basis. There was even some optimism that they could do it as regularly as uh, one or every two weeks or so, because they hope that the space shuttle program will be, a, in effect, a space truck, a kind of orbiting laboratory for space concerns. It will be an effort to launch a lot of communication satellites, which they've done already. But this is going to set it back, and the United States has an enormous investment in all of this, not just financially, but politically and now emotionally as well. Dan Molina is in Houston. Dan? Tom, we're going to go back to this morning early when we saw the uh, astronauts for the first time this morning going through the routine that has become so familiar to us now, a very happy routine as they began their day. This was the breakfast. You can see the entire crew there with their mission cake, that a tradition, out in front of them all posing for what they were very confident would be a launch today. After the hang-ups of several days, the weather was cold, but they felt that it would be okay. They got their door handle fixed. That was something that hung them up yesterday. Delayed the launch long enough for the uh, winds to kick up and uh, delay the launch finally. Now you see them, that's Dick Scobie walking out, Judy Resnick, all of them walking out to the uh, truck that would take them to the launch pad. There you see Sharon Krista McAuliffe, the teacher in space, going into the elevator. The doors will close now and they'll head out towards the launch pad. This, of course, as we say, a very happy morning for them. Everything seemed to be going just right. Applause from, the, from their uh, ground control teams as they headed out onto the, uh, to, towards the launch pad. There's Dick Scobie and Judy Resnick heading up the team. Big smile from Krista McCullough. Ellie Onizuka giving a wave. Headed for the van that would take them out towards the launch pad. Big smiles today. They got an extra hour of sleep this morning because the uh, launch was delayed by one hour early. That because of a problem with an electronic fire detector out on the launch pad. Now that fire detector comes to mind at this point, but we were told earlier on that the fire detector was part of the equipment on the launch pad itself and nothing that was attached to the orbiter. And so that at this, at this point at least, would seem to be ruled out as uh, anything that might be connected with the disaster. Krista McAuliffe there donning the uh, suit that they wear, the uh, equipment that they wear for a uh, ditch into the ocean. That, uh, that vest that they are putting on now is equipped with several items that can keep them uh, safe in the ocean should they land the shuttle in the ocean and then use some of the emergency exits that the shuttle is equipped with. That, of course, would happen during a landing on the ocean, which became a possibility, you can recall, a couple flights back when uh, there was an apparent failure of a main engine. Those main engines have been of concern ever since the beginning of the program. The uh, main engine was shut down after a sensor showed it to be overheating, and that was the occasion for a great deal of worry that the shuttle might go down either at one of the emergency landing sites or perhaps in the ocean. And that would occasion the use of those vests which uh, Krista is now putting on her back. It's equipped with a number of uh, life-saving uh, devices, including a raft that can keep them afloat for some 24 hours on the water. Of course, uh, in this case, there appears to have been no chance that they could have ever gotten to the water. That explosion in mid-flight, we are told, 18 miles downrange. Tom? Thanks very much, Dan Molina. We want to remind everyone that this was the 25th flight in the shuttle series. It was the 10th launch of the Challenger vehicle. And standing by this morning at Cape Canaveral is NBC News correspondent Steve Delaney, who was there for the launch itself. Steve? Tom, it was a, it was a magnificent morning. After all the trouble they'd had in the last day or so, came up nice, clear, bright dawn. We were all telling each other that we could see this thing all the way to Africa downrange as we watched it. And, this is the first one I've seen, and, and I was standing out here on the porch where we've done these things so many times collectively, watched it up in the air, and suddenly there was a stunned silence, and so everybody was saying, hey, something is not normal here, and that's apparently when the explosion happened, and you could see that within a few minutes after the liftoff, there was something that was obviously and tragically gone wrong with this. 
they have been they had been uh, waiting for this moment for quite a long time. This really should have been the sixth day of this flight. It was put off a couple of times last week because of bad weather in Africa and some of the alternate landing sites, and it was put off yesterday for mechanical problems. But it was it was that great rushing roar of sound, that too bright to look at light, that powerful thrust of all that energy going straight up and into outer space that we have watched on television over and over again. Seeing it for the first time this morning, it was a great rush, a great, a great thrill. And then all of a sudden, as they got to about a minute and a few seconds into the flight, it became clear that something wasn't going right. Engines at 65 percent, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells. And they're about, at this point, they're about to take the engine power back up to uh, achieve the lift all the way into the low orbit that they were looking for, the elliptical orbit that they take up before they start station keeping up there. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. Tom, it wasn't that visible from the ground, but at this point, it was very clear people were gasping, and you can see the two sides of the, of the debris going out, almost looking like a pair of cow's horns, each curving in a different direction. Nobody was quite sure what we were looking at at that point, yeah, Steve. except it was very clear that something was awfully wrong. Yeah, the only thing that looked to be to be intact, to my naked eye at least, was one of the solid rocket boosters that seemed to be going off in one direction but everything else seemed to have been virtually destroyed by the magnitude of that explosion at what appeared to be the base of the rocket. Of course, it's back there that the uh, main engines are located. And that's well, that's the... where all the energy was being burned, and, and um, I think I heard somebody from the, from the mission control in Houston say a few minutes ago that it was just after the three main engines to burn that this happened, and absolutely without warning. There was no anomaly, as they say. There was no indication here or from the things that the controllers were saying, that anything was happening other than a great, dramatic, beautiful liftoff, as we've seen so many times before. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on there right now in terms of the crowd? Are people sticking around? That It's always a big attraction in Florida, of course, but uh, a tragedy of this scope. Uh, are people staying around to hear what the final answer is, or are they just drifting away, Steve? Well, as usually happens, there was a, a tremendous number in the, the yellow tent back there that you may be able to see. There's a, a VIP section. There were eight or ten busloads of people who had been invited here to watch this. Some of them were uh, educators. Some of them were people with a special interest in, in either the hardware they were carrying along or something else. Um, as soon as this happened, of course, we all got so busy that, that we didn't really notice what happened to them, but they're not here. Um, reporters began to scuttle around in various directions trying to first of all comprehend what had happened and then see what what if anything we could we could do to help other people understand what was going on. Uh, Steve and Tom. What happened to the spectators I don't know. Okay yes John Palmer in New York. Uh, yeah we're hearing now from uh, NASA they say that the rescue teams are just now being allowed to enter the impact zone and the new coordinates we have of the impact zone here are 10.4 miles uprange eight miles out over the ocean uh, where the uh, the uh, the impact uh, occurred. They say they're just now being allowed into the area because uh, for some minutes uh, after the impact, there was a lot of debris, some of what we saw there in that replay of the explosion, falling out of the sky, and it would be just too dangerous to, to get into that particular area. But again, uh, of course, we have no word on the fate but it, uh, of the crew, but it doesn't look very good. There were, what, uh, three Coast Guard cutters, John, I'm told, and two helicopters in that area. That's right. And they're just now, it's uh, about one hour after the explosion, one hour and a couple of minutes maybe, that they're finally in, able to enter that area. But as you say, debris continues to fall into the ocean there. Uh, there has been no indication whatsoever from NASA of any sign of life, we uh, continue to point out to you. We have no confirmation, of course, that the seven-person crew was killed. But the fact of the matter is, uh, if you looked at those pictures as we did, it seemed that no one could possibly survive that. Fred Francis is at the de Defense Department this morning. And Fred, what do they uh, have out there in terms of uh, rescue vehicles and rescue uh, ships? Well, Tom, this has become so routine that they just had three Coast Guard cutters out there this morning, uh, only one assigned to actually patrol up and down and uh, keep spectators away from the, the launch area just off the coast. Uh, but, of course, as soon as it happened, the United States Navy began moving its ships. And right now, we're told that a U.S. Navy hydrofoil, the USS Pegasus, 
is about uh, 30 minutes from the scene and heading full speed in that direction, along with the uh, U.S. Navy frigate, the USS Underwood, and, uh, and that's about an hour and 20 minutes away. But Tom, I must tell you that within seconds of uh, watching that explosion here at the Pentagon with uh, several Air Force officers, they did not know what happened, but they were very certain that, that the devastation of the explosion, one man said, nobody survived that. So what they're going to do now is actually look for pieces, uh, pick up all the pieces that are possible in that area. And, uh, and as, as we saw it shower down, it's going to be quite a wide area of, of picking up debris. Yeah, Fred, also the uh, shuttle, of course, has military applications. The uh, United States military has hoped to use it for a variety of mostly classified purposes thus far. My guess is that this will put everything on hold in terms of the shuttle program, not just for civilian purposes, but for military purposes as well. As you were talking with those Air Force officers, do they have any thoughts on that? Well, that has been a long-running controversy here at the Pentagon. Many in, many, many in the Air Force want to have the, uh, the expendable launch vehicles used without the shuttle to put into orbit uh, reconnaissance satellites and communication satellites. They don't feel and they have not felt for a long time that the shuttle has been reliable enough to put up those time-urgent satellites that the United States so depends on. And of course, this will fuel that controversy. Many in the Air Force will say we have to go to the expendable vehicles. We must put our satellites in the air apart from NASA. And that will hurt NASA, of course, not just from a tragedy like this, because NASA depends so much on millions and millions of dollars given to it by the Air Force for launching those satellites. Uh, Fred, right now we're looking at live NASA pictures out over the Cape. This is the ocean just off the coast of Florida. Uh, that's near Cocoa Beach, Florida. It's a familiar site, of course. The Kennedy Space Center located at Cape Canaveral. A sparkling clear day. It's been cold in Florida. Tom, interesting, interesting, Tom, that we usually have a, uh, a Soviet trawler or some sort of Soviet spy ship off the coast of Cape Canaveral for almost every one of these launches. And perhaps they've become so routine for them as well that on this day, uh, the United States Navy says there are no Soviet vessels in the area. Well, those clear blue skies and uh, that sparkling ocean are quite a contrast, of course, to the tragedy that we are describing for you today. The blow-up of the shuttle Challenger about two minutes after it left the launch pad at Cape Canaveral with seven people on board, including schoolteacher Krista McAuliffe. Robert Rizal, NBC News chief science correspondent, is at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, where he was preparing a report on the Voyager spacecraft. The Voyager, of course, has been taking pictures of the Uranus moons and other uh, objects in outer space. That had hoped to be a triumph uh, a report today. Instead, we're dealing with this tragedy. Bob, do you think that NASA just went too far in terms of its public relations efforts by putting a teacher on board after putting a couple of congressional people in what, under almost any circumstances, is a pretty high-risk situation. It certainly is. In fact, I think I could inject a personal note here because the commander of that mission, Francis Scobie, who was known as Dick Scobie, uh, as you remember, Tom, on the, er uh, on the earlier uh, sp space missions, we always had an astronaut who was our advisor, and Dick Scobie was one uh, on the first mission uh, where Sally Ride flew, so he was with us for a long time, and I got to know the man very well. And I remember one night we were driving back uh, from the launch pad, and he said to me that someday one of these things is going to blow up. I remember this conversation very well. He said it's a very complex piece of machinery. It has a lot of explosives on it. He said someday, like, like there's bound to be airplane crashes, he said, someday one of these is going to blow up. And he said, I certainly hope that when that happens, it won't end the space shuttle program or put it in jeopardy. Now, that was what he said. I remember it very clearly now. But, of course, I think that his prediction won't be true. I think that this is going to cause, uh, of course, a very long delay, if not... Uh, an abandonment of manned space flight for a while because uh, in terms of the public relations effort of course it couldn't have been worse but just in terms of trying to understand what happened is it worth it to put people in space because there's been a lot of criticism in Congress to say that most of the things that are being done by these people could in fact be done by robots and this may lead to a lot more thinking in that direction yeah well my guess is Bob that there will be no more civilians in space for a long long time in the shuttle program and that the program itself will be delayed but the United States investment is so considerable and there is potential there that they will be able to reactivate the program down the road a ways, but certainly they're going to have to work out the problems that they've been having recently with these delayed launches and then today this enormous tragedy. We have a report here that top NASA officials have told Representative Manuel Lujan of New Mexico that it doesn't look like any lives were saved when the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded today. 
congressional aide reporting that. Steve Goldstein, who was Luhan's aide, said that Dr. William Graham, the NASA administrator, and his legislative assistant, Jack Murphy, were meeting with Luhan on Capitol Hill to discuss the agency's budget at the time of liftoff at about 11.38 this morning, and then he was told that it doesn't look like any of the lives were saved. Of course, this was uh, stunning to people in Congress as well. There was a moment of silent prayer. The House immediately adjourned for about two hours. A terrible thing, a terrible thing. Those are the words of House Speaker Thomas P. Tip O'Neill. Now let's go to Capitol Hill for the reaction from there. John Dancy. Tom, I'm in the uh, Senate press gallery at the moment. As you can imagine, a number of uh, television crews are assembling here, starting to set up their equipment, because uh, this is the place that one of the first reactions will be felt here on Capitol Hill, because once, uh, once uh, something like this happens, of course, it has a tremendous effect all across the country, and that's felt here on Capitol Hill. You were, you were talking earlier, Tom, about the fact that uh, this may cause a great delay in it. Certainly there are going to be calls for, from Congress for investigations of what went wrong. There will certainly be calls for uh, NASA to hold up, not to launch anymore, and Congress will be a key player in that. We are waiting right now for Senator Jake Garn, who's expected here in the Senate gallery momentarily. Senator Garn, of course, uh, is the only senator to have ever flown in a space shuttle. Congressman Bill Nelson from Florida flew on the last space shuttle, and of course both of them uh, have first-hand knowledge of what happens during that moment of throttle up, and we're waiting for Senator Garn to come here. Interestingly enough, Tom, over the Christmas holiday, I was talking with Senator John Glenn about uh, the space program, the Mercury program, when he was in it, and he was reminiscing, and he said that during that time, when there were seven astronauts, they often talked themselves about the fact that there might be one or two of them who didn't come back, who didn't make it, because it was such a dangerous program. And he was marveling about the fact that the space shuttle had been such a tremendously successful program that the first space shuttle was, in fact, launched without a test program. It was launched with men aboard. Tom? Thank you very much. And, of course, we had... Uh that uh, flight in January of 1967, shuttle uh, the uh, Apollo 1, when there was a fire on board, Virgil Grissom and two other astronauts were killed, and that we've not had any deaths in the space program until now. There have been some close calls along the way, but nothing, nothing approaching what has happened today here in the skies over Cape Canaveral, Florida, the Kennedy Space Center, there on the east coast of Florida, about halfway down the peninsula. These are live pictures, and somewhere out there, rescue ships and other vehicles now, other Helicopters, other vessels are attempting to find out what they can to recover what they can of the debris from the space shuttle Challenger. The silence is deafening. There is no word from NASA, no word from the rescue vehicles, no, no word whatsoever uh, on what may have happened to the seven people on board, but there is no indication whatsoever that they could possibly have survived the enormous explosion that we all saw and that we'll show you now if you're just joining us about two minutes into the flight today which lifted off at 11.38 Eastern Time this morning. Gimbal now underway. T-minus 15 seconds. Go with throttle up. One minute, 
15 seconds. Velocity 2,900 feet per second. Altitude 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance 7 nautical miles. Nine miles up in the sky, the explosion occurred. You could hear the NASA narrator uh, as he continued to read the signals and not watch what was happening on the monitor itself. There was the explosion. As you can see, it seems almost impossible that anyone could have survived that. Ironically enough, it was 19 years ago yesterday that they had the fire on board the Apollo spacecraft, of course, in which three astronauts were killed. Dan Molina is at the Johnson Space Center in uh, Houston, Texas, where they're monitoring all of the telemetry or the signals that they have uh, so far. Dan? Tom, we just heard again from Steve Nesbitt, who is the NASA commentator. Actually, he is speaking now, if it's possible for us to listen in. Uh, a pause there. Steve told us that the recovery teams are searching the coastal we will provide area, additional information and he repeated as his understatement earlier that we had an incident. We are going to see now, uh, we're going to go now to a tape from earlier in the day, uh, when Steve Nesbitt narrated all that NASA knew in the minutes after the explosion, all that NASA knew about what happened. Let's listen to that now. Uh, we did have uh, this morning at uh, uh, launch time. Launch time was approximately uh, 10.38 uh, central time. Uh, on launch, approximately a minute or so after uh, tower clear, there was an apparent explosion of uh, the orbiter. At the time, um, uh, data was lost uh, approximately a minute into the flight. Uh, that was uh, shortly after a throttle up to 104% of the three main engines. The flight director pulled uh, positions, flight controller positions in the room uh, later on and this morning and uh, was informed that there were no anomalous indications uh, at the time. Uh, tracking reported uh, impact of the vehicle uh, with the water. Uh, according to data, that was approximately 18 miles downrange at the time uh, data stopped. Recovery forces being deployed to the field, being uh, they're unable, were unable uh, shortly to uh, to enter the specific area because of a continuing falling debris and at about this time are being admitted uh, to the impact area. Contingency procedures are in effect and following those procedures all of the data uh, available in, in mission control uh, from the flight at the point uh, or up to the point of the incident uh, data is being secured and will be carefully evaluated. We have no additional information at this time and we'll keep you advised as other details become available. This is Mission Control, Houston. And as we say, there has been very little substantial information to add beyond that since the, uh, since the incident happened. These, the first apparent deaths in the space uh, program since the deaths of Ed White, Roger Chafee, and Gus Grissom on the Apollo 1 launch pad many years ago. Uh, Tom, I must say that uh, I was hearing uh, Bob Bazell and you and some of the other gentlemen talking about the impact of this on the U.S. space program. It's well to remember how much of the U.S. space effort has been invested in the shuttle itself, and that has been another of the criticisms of it through the years, is that we are shoving so much into the space shuttle program, leaving very little left for anything else. The space shuttle program is essential to the space station program that is planned, both the uh, NASA space station and a private space station that is planned for the next several years. It's essential to interplanetary exploration that's scheduled for later this year. It is the focus of the U.S. space program. And so now we find that uh, whatever happens to the shuttle program, whatever its fate after this tragedy, it will affect most of the rest of the U.S. space shuttle program uh, as well. Tom? Even before today's explosion, of course, as you indicate, there were uh, uh, all manner of criticisms of the space shuttle program, whether or not we had invested too much, whether or not it was appropriate for the United States to be involved in a governmental way with private enterprise and the launching of satellites, whether or not we could ever pay for the space shuttle program. There were some very ambitious plans at the very beginning for launching, as I said, on a regular basis. So far, they have not panned out. The military use of it, uh, some people indicated that uh, the domestic side of the budget was paying for what was ultimately going to be a military vehicle of one kind or another for the launching of secret weapons or secret satellites. So today's tragedy will bring all that sharply into focus and we will have 
My guess is a national forum now examining what has gone wrong with the space shuttle program and what the future of it ought to be. It was at about nine miles up in the air today when the space shuttle program came apart, literally in the skies, and apparently seven people were killed. Once again, videotape of that tragic moment. This is in slow motion. As you can see it, the sky filled with fire and an explosion that according to Roy Neal, some scientists are saying is the size of a small nuclear blast. Tom, the, uh, the NASA officials are saying that it's really virtually impossible for them to have prepared for a disaster of this kind while they have a 100 member recovery crew uh, there at the launch site right along the landing strip should there uh, a trouble develop and should the space shuttle have to come back for an emergency landing they're there to help out but there's really nothing that they can do out uh, over the open sea except have ships in position and try to, to get there and pick up the pieces and see what they can do well after the fact. Yeah, John, what they have is in effect uh, uh, plans prepared in case there's something minor that goes wrong and that airplane, the space shuttle, and that's really what it is, has to make a quick return and make a landing back once again at the Kennedy Space Center but nothing to prepare for an explosion of this kind, a tragedy of this scope, because there's no way that you could get out of that. Even if you had parachutes, you're at nine miles up. And of course, it's very unlikely that anyone could survive a parachute jump of that magnitude. And they were not prepared to do that in any event. Uh, there are some emergency escape procedures for when it's on the ground, in case something goes wrong then. There is, as I say, some, uh, there are some prepared uh, uh, emergency procedures for if something minor goes wrong and they can return and then they have what they call a once around procedure if something goes wrong and they don't get into the orbit that they want to they can land in Spain or they can land in California different places but nothing to deal with an explosion of this kind today because there seemed to be nothing left of the spacecraft itself. We're told that at the time of the explosion that uh, Dr. William Graham, who is the administrator of NASA, was on Capitol Hill. He was getting ready to meet with a congressman and talk about NASA's budget. And uh, just as they were ready to start that meeting, uh, the administrator Graham said, let's turn on the TV and watch the liftoff of the shuttle Challenger. Uh, they saw it and uh, immediately he knew something was wrong and uh, we were told he called officials at NASA and uh, said what has happened and uh, they told him uh, of course there had been an explosion and there was very little chance that there could be any survivors uh, aboard the shuttle. Okay we expect to hear from uh, Senator Jake Garn who is on Capitol Hill today uh, in about 10 minutes at the Senate press gallery. Senator Garn was the first civilian to go on board uh, one of these flights. There was some criticism at the time that he was chosen for that flight because he's on a committee that is instrumental in determining the size of the NASA budget. He's a former Air Force fighter pilot and yet he did have some difficulty on re-entry. You'll remember when he got off the space shuttle in California his legs were a little wobbly and it took him a while to recover but nonetheless he said that it was an exhilarating experience for him and there had been plans on the part of NASA to have a wide range of civilian passengers on board the shuttle uh, Senator Bill Nelson, whose district in which uh, Kennedy Space Center is located, went uh, on this recently completed flight. A teacher today, Krista McAuliffe, plans for a journalist at some point, plans for other scientists from outside the NASA community to go on as well. There have been hopes that uh, as the program proceeds, that private enterprise, uh, pharmaceutical companies, and other scientific companies can put up their own specialists to perform experiments in the weightless condition that exists in the big payload bay, which is at the back of the space shuttle vehicle itself. Uh, we are now coming up in about one hour and uh, 20 minutes uh, after the explosion. Still no confirmation of the fate of the seven people on board, but to repeat once again, there is no indication whatsoever that any of them could have survived that explosion. Steve Delaney is at the Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral, Florida now. Steve? Yes, Tom. In, in terms of looking ahead at where NASA goes from here, it was, it was probably also a good idea to look back a little bit because this was the 25th lift. This was the 10th time for the workhorse of the fleet, the Challenger. And they had accomplished a great number of things. They had laid to rest with, by putting civilians up in the air. They had laid to rest some of the mystique that was built up around the early uh, NASA astronauts. You'd no longer had to be a test pilot. You no longer had to be a specialist in one sort or another. You could be, and today was, for the first time, included in the crew, an ordinary citizen. And we're looking at pictures now that, that 
indicate how difficult it is going to be to find and recover and make sense of what happened this morning. The pieces, they say, have still been raining down from the sky. They came from a long way up. The smaller ones, the ones that are made basically out of scrap sheet metal. The heavier pieces, they gave us an impact time and point a long while back. Not very, the, 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 in fact, the heavier pieces, Tom, seemed to come down almost as fast as they went up which was quite fast indeed. NASA does have a helicopter, which is part of the coverage pattern that they have for showing us the pictures of the launch early on, and that, that camera is now out over the search area taking a look, and there's just an awful lot of blank space out there, and the chances of finding anything that, uh, that would end, the, the tune up the hearts of people who are worried about the crew are, are pretty remote. But, uh, yes, Tom, it just, it just seems that whatever started so well, I mean, the, the luck tends to go in cycles, and they'd had a run of bad luck and a run of delays for sometimes seem, seemingly silly reasons, but this morning everything looked so well that uh, it, it just was that much more unexpected when this flight uh, ended in such tragedy. Steve, uh, I think what happens is that in this high-tech world in which we all live these days, we expect these things to go off flawlessly. We expect all kinds of what would be considered minor miracles just 10 years ago to be part of our routine lives. And I think maybe that television has contributed to some of that as well because we've covered a number of these launches. They have been quite beautiful. I can tell you as one who has watched a number of them from where Steve Delaney is today, it's an exhilarating experience. It seems as, no as if nothing can go wrong. After all, we're putting a 37-year-old woman school teacher on board the space shuttle. Uh, there's a lot of excitement about that. Well, that's what but I it is about. A, but it's that's a very complicated piece of machinery, and it is highly volatile. Well, it, it certainly was this morning. Uh, Krista McAuliffe was, uh, was selected, as you recall, over the uh, about 11,000 other applicants, all of who wanted to get in on this program. There have been 1,400 or so journalists who have, uh, who have uh, submitted their, their names in a deadline that recently passed to be the first professional storyteller to go into space and turn around and come back and try to to increase the, the knowledge of what's been going on uh, um, they used to say about astronauts that they were very good pilots and not very good poets but uh, the the idea was to to try to make the kind of magic that that the space program had become more available to people who had who who had no special training as as uh, perfect physical specimens or uh, test pilots uh, a long way between a 37-year-old lady school teacher and the kind of people who we had with the, the Glens and the Shiraz and the first crop of astronauts who flew the Mercury program out of here so many years ago. Steve, uh, we have yes, the first sir. reaction from uh, Nancy Reagan, who was watching, it turns out, the launch of the uh, shuttle this morning in the private quarters of the White House, and one of her spokespersons said that Mrs. Uh, Reagan's reaction immediately was, oh my God. She watched in shocked disbelief, we're told. She uh, said that she would start praying for some thread of hope. Tragically, as well, not only were 1,200 students of Concord High School, where Mrs. McAuliffe taught watching this on television today, but at the Cape itself, her family was assembled. Her husband, Stephen, and two small children, a boy and a girl, uh, young Scott and Caroline, were there watching, too. Mother and father. They, they appear not to know quite what's going wrong. Now, the realization.
A call of parents watching today at Cape Canaveral. You could hear the NASA commentator in the background say there's a major malfunction. Now I think it is beginning to dawn on them that something terribly is wrong. You can hear another NASA official in the background saying, let's get out of this area. At the Senate press gallery, uh, Senator Jake Garn, the first civilian to go up in the space shuttle, talking to reporters now. Let's go there. Reaction to what happened today? Well, it's very difficult for me to talk about it because these were my friends. Mike Smith, the uh, pilot, was my mother hen the first month that I trained. They assigned him to me, go to my classes and help uh, brief me. And I don't know of any time that I have been more shocked or more moved than when my first wife was killed in an automobile accident. And so it's been uh, very, very difficult for me this morning. What does this do to the space program here and its support on the Hill, Senator? Well, I have great confidence in the space program. I think it's a remarkable system. And I think we should push ahead after we have determined the cause. Obviously, we should not fly until we have determined the cause of this particular failure. But I think we need to look at all of the successes, the remarkable safety record that the space program has had, the benefits that uh, come from it. And the crew members that I knew so well, I would expect that they would want us to go ahead with the space program after we have gone through the proper investigations and analysis and know what happened. How should we go about investigating this? Well, obviously, you have to gather all of the data. It has been impounded at this point. There have to be a lot of studies, but there are some superbly qualified experts in this area that I think will be able to determine the, what the failure was. Senator. You were on board the space shuttle. You felt that tremendous boost that you got. Now, from the telemetry that we heard, the voice data that we heard, they had just told the pilot to go to full throttle, and he had said he was throttling up. What happens at that moment? You have a combination of the solid rocket booster power and liquid hydrogen and oxygen in the main tank. And because most of your thrust comes from the solid rocket boosters, while you're still in the atmosphere, you can exceed the maximum dynamic pressure. So the main engines are only at about 60% of power until you get further out of the atmosphere. And they had just been given the command to throttle up. And then you go to 104% or maximum power on the solids or on the liquids. And so that is exactly what had taken place. They were high enough so they would not endanger the orbiter from too much pressure and were given that order that they could proceed to uh, what, increase the power. What are some of the things that can go wrong at that moment? Well, you have a very large external tank of very volatile liquid hydrogen and oxygen. And uh, you're just simply, it's like in uh, an automobile, you are putting more fuel. You're pushing down on the accelerator. You're putting more fuel to bring more uh, power. And, of course, at this point, we don't know whether it was one of the solids, we don't know whether it was the liquid engines or not. There's just uh, no way to know at this point. Senator, you know, what was your opinion of the amount of uh, missions that NASA had scheduled for this year? Do you think that they were capable of going ahead with 14 or 15 safely? Yes, I think so. The major problem uh, these last couple of missions has been uh, weather, and that is something that NASA cannot control. But, uh, yes, I think the program was mature enough that and with the opening of the second pad, Pad B, which Challenger was launched from this morning, with two pads I, and also the addition of the fourth orbiter, yes, I think they were capable of that schedule. Do you, Do you think, think it's going to make any difference to civilians in space from now on? Well, I can't judge what decisions NASA will make, but uh, my own opinion, again, after the investigations, we should proceed with the program, and that would include the... Uh, the civilians in space program as well. As a civilian yourself going in, were you adequately warned that something like this could happen? Oh, of course. The, the training is very thorough and uh, very adequate. In my own case, having flown more than 10,000 hours, I was certainly aware that there are dangers in uh, flying. However, I still feel very strongly that uh, I'm much safer in flying an aircraft than any day that I'm on the uh, Capitol Beltway, and I don't mean that to be facetious at all. We kill nearly 50,000 people a year on the automobile in the highways of this country because of half of them because of drunk driving. 
So I wish we'd pay a lot more attention uh, to that. Senator, so, should there have been some way for them, or was there any way for them to get out at this point? Should there have been? No, I don't think so. In uh, Columbia, originally, during the test phase, when just uh, they were sending two test pilots up, they did have an escape uh, capsule. The program had re uh, been proved safe enough, in my opinion, that they didn't need them in the other orbiters, and Columbia had been modified so that it did not have the escape mechanism in it. Uh, this is purely my opinion, but in watching what happened this morning, I would doubt very much, even if you had had an escape capsule on board or parachutes, that it would have been possible to get out with that kind of an explosion uh, in any event. Senator, in light of all of the delays surrounding recent shuttles and this one, do you think that NASA may have been too anxious to get this one off the ground? No. No, I was down on Saturday and for the launch on Sunday morning, and they were criticized on Sunday for being overly careful. Safety has always been uh, foremost in their minds. And we woke up on Sunday morning after having canceled at 10 o'clock the night before to a perfect morning. <clears throat> it was beautiful, sunny, clear blue skies, perfect launch, and there was a lot of talk that rather irritated me while well, NASA was overly cautious. And so, no, I don't think that's true at all. What happens in your subcommittee now in terms of funding for the program? Well, I can't answer that question exactly because of Graham Rudman and the other budget constraints, but I certainly have no intentions other than to push on and uh, that does not change the uh, intent or the progress of the program. How do, how do you think the investigation ought to be handled, Senator? Should there be some sort of blue ribbon panel put together or should NASA be uh, uh, allowed to handle it? Well, I think NASA has the technical experts, and if they need more than in-house, they will uh, pull them in. I don't think we need to uh, to go outside that other than to draw on consultants if, if necessary. NASA is so thorough and so careful. If any of you had experienced how they go through the redundancy and the backups and careful nature, the dedication of these scientists and engineers in NASA, I have full faith in them. They want the program to succeed. They want to take care of their uh, astronauts. It's always a real team effort. They work closely uh, together, and they will want to find out what happened more than anybody else. Senator, how lucky do you feel today that you returned safely? Well, I don't uh, feel particularly lucky. I, I think the program is, is reliable. In all uh, programs, in flight test programs for aircraft, we have, uh, we have accidents. And I, I don't, uh, it's a surprise to me that it happened, but I, I would go again tomorrow. If, if NASA would let me go, I would go again. What effect is this likely to have on the community of astronauts? Well, first of all, they're all such a close-knit group. They're not looking any beyond today except the sorrow of losing some of their, uh, their companions. You go through each one. I knew Kristen McAuliffe uh, the least of them because she wasn't there. Greg Jarvis I trained with, Dick Scobie I knew, Mike Smith was my mother hen and you go on Azuka flew uh, in January last year when I was flying so it's uh, and where they live together all the time, they train together, they fly together, there's obviously utter shock and disbelief down at Houston today among the astronaut corps. On your mission was the crew equipped with parachutes and were there ejection seats? No. No, only uh, Columbia had them uh, at the beginning of the mission, just during the first, I don't remember, three or four missions. Senator Jake Garn, thank, thank you Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. And obviously and understandably shaken Senator Jake Garn, who knew, of course, uh, the members of that crew because he had trained with NASA and had flown uh, just a couple of missions ago on one of the space shuttle flights. He's a, a veteran uh, fighter pilot and he was obviously uh, very shaken by what happened here today. Dan Molina in Houston, any additional information at the Johnson Space Center? Tom, we are hearing absolutely nothing new at this point. The NASA Select, which is the broadcast system which gives us information from NASA, has been completely quiet since the last information we heard, which was, again, that there were no anomalies noted as the uh, as the shuttle was taking off, that translates to nothing apparently going wrong as they were watching all of their instruments in mission control. Mission control here has complete control of the launch sequence after the shuttle clears the tower. 
They have all the information from the orbiter systems, systems and the computers coming into them here. They were noticing nothing wrong. Again, they were at the point where the shuttle powers up to 104% of its rated capacity. That's a normal procedure during launch, a procedure that allows them to uh, get into their proper telemetry for flight. We are seeing now a picture of mission control. There is absolutely nothing happening in there right now. The people are glued to whatever information they can get off of their monitors. There are, there are very few muscles twitching. Now, as you see there, right under the word Houston, that is where the flight director sits. He is the man who is in complete charge of this. And you can see them just sitting there waiting for the analysis through their computers of the computer information and the telemetry information that they were getting at the time. Behind the flight director is seated the flight operations director. He is the man that communicates with the NASA administration during these launches. Yeah, Dan, if you, if you were listening to Senator Garner, as I know that you were, it does appear that what happened is, is they went to full throttle to 104% on those main engines at the back of the spacecraft that are fueled by that big external tank. That's the orange tank that you see, 560,000 pounds of oxygen and hydrogen as they push down in effect to go to full throttle as they were lifting off into their orbit, they hope. That appears to be the moment when everything went wrong, when the explosion had occurred. And of course, if there was any malfunction whatsoever, that big external tank is a bomb in effect. And that's really what it is. It's a huge external tank filled with a highly volatile material. And it appears that's when things went tragically very wrong indeed. Yes, yes, Tom, indeed. As we were hearing from uh, Bob Bazell and, and Roy Neal earlier on, the astronauts knew, they all know, that something like this was possible with the shuttle. When you talk to them privately, anywhere along through the space shuttle program, they would tell you something big is going to happen one day. If it's not a main engine, something serious is going to happen, and we know it, and we're willing to take the risk, huh? All right, thanks, Dan Molina. Now to the White House and Chris Wallace, who has been able to talk with President Reagan. Chris? Well, Tom, uh, the President uh, came into the uh, Roosevelt Room across the hall from the Oval Office just a few moments ago to give us his thoughts about uh, this tragedy. Uh, he uh, said that uh, he had no more information than we did, hard information as to what had gone on down in... Uh, at Cape Canaveral, but uh, all indications seem to be, and the way both he and his top aides were talking was that uh, as if they believe that all seven of the people on board the shuttle uh, are dead. Let me give you some of the questions and answers in a brief on-the-record, off-camera session that the president had with reporters. Uh, he said, uh, it's a horrible thing all of us have witnessed. I can't rid myself of the thought of the sacrifice of the families who were there at the Cape and watching this tragedy also. Uh, I can't help but think what they must be going through. Uh, he then said that he has no more information, although the White House is now on an open line to NASA, that he and his top aides have no more information basically than we are getting from NASA uh, through the public information officer. He was asked whether or not he's going to halt all systems, uh, all space flights of the shuttle until he finds out what happened. He said, I do have confidence in the people running the program. This is the first fatal accident in 56 flights. Obviously, we want to find uh, out uh, what happened and so that it won't happen again, and I'm sure that there will be no more flights until uh, the flight controllers are absolutely certain of what went wrong and how to repair it. He said, you know, in the past, some of us have gotten a bit impatient with all of the holds in these flights and wondered whether perhaps uh, the flight controllers were a little overzealous, a little too careful. He said, today we tragically found out that, no, that we do need those precautions. Uh, as to the fact that a private citizen, Krista McAuliffe, the teacher from New Hampshire, was on board this flight, he said, look, all seven of those people uh, are citizens, all seven of them were volunteers, no one goes on that space flight who wasn't uh, very much interested and very much desirous of getting a, a coveted seat on the shuttle. He said that the space program is basically the last frontier. Uh, I guess we have become so confident that things would go right that it comes as an especially great shock when suddenly something goes so terribly wrong. He said that he will go ahead with the State of the Union message tonight saying that things like that have to go on. We have to go on governing the nation, but he said that obviously there will be a reference to this tragedy during his speech tonight to a joint session of Congress. As for any backlash against the space shuttle, he said no, accidents happen in every line of transportation, and obviously up till now the space shuttle's uh, safety record was perfect. As to who brought him the news, he said that he was in the Oval Office uh, preparing for a bri background briefing he was going to have with reporters when Vice President Bush and uh, National Security Advisor John Poindexter came in and uh, handed him a note saying that the space shuttle had exploded, no further details. 
then uh, the president, uh, Bush and Poindexter all went to a small yes. study that the president has just off the Oval Office, and like everybody else, turned on their TV to see what was happening, watched uh, to their horror uh, tape replays of the explosion. Uh, he called it a, quote, very traumatic experience. Uh, he said that this will indeed cast a pall on his speech tonight, which he had hoped to use as a, an opportunity to push his program for the next legislative year. But he said uh, that while they will mention it, uh, you have to go on governing the nation. Uh, as for Krista McAuliffe, and it, there was a certain uh, bitter irony in this because Krista McAuliffe was named to the space program uh, several months ago in the Roosevelt Room, the room where we were all with the president. And at that time, it was, of course, a great source of pride to Mr. Reagan, who had come up with the idea of putting a teacher in space. He said that I can't get out of my mind the thought of her husband and her children uh, who were watching as the uh, shuttle exploded. He said, of course, all the other families, many of them were also there, but they, uh, as test pilots, uh, the families of test pilots were more aware of the dangers of this program. He said, uh, knowing that they were there and watching, your heart goes out to them. Uh, one other footnote, Tom, we have been told that Mrs. Reagan was upstairs in the family quarters alone and just happened to have the TV set on and was watching live uh, when the flight lifted off and said, oh my God, no, and was very upset when she saw live uh, the terrible tragedy. Thank you, Chris Wallace of the White House today. And as he indicated, the uh, State of the Union address will go on tonight as scheduled before a joint session of Congress at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. NBC News will have coverage of that and will have continuing coverage all day long here of uh, this enormous tragedy involving the Space Shuttle Challenger. All seven crew members on board, including the school teacher, Krista McAuliffe, appeared to have perished in an, a giant explosion that occurred two minutes after liftoff today about 18 miles downrange, about five miles up in the air. There are recovery crews now in the area, but so far no word from them. They couldn't even enter the area for a time because there was so much debris falling. The most arresting pictures so far today, in addition to the explosion itself, occurred at the Cape where Krista McAuliffe's husband and her two children were watching along with her parents, Ed and Grace Corrigan of Framingham, Massachusetts. They stood silently during the launch, not entirely sure of what they were seeing, I'm, I'm confident. They remained standing together as the loudspeaker brought that chilling announcement. There appears to have been a major malfunction. The vehicle has exploded, it was then, uh, they were then told. And Mrs. Corrigan, that is Krista McAuliffe's mother, looked at the NASA official and repeated his words as a question. The vehicle has exploded. Tom. This was to have been a triumphant day, of course, for Krista McAuliffe. Uh, she was selected by this administration as the first school teacher to go in space. And Dan Molina now remembers a happier time when, in fact, that selection was made. The ten finalists, all the testing, training, and dreaming was over. It all came down to this one moment in the White House. First, Vice President Bush announced the backup for the flight, Barbara Morgan of McCall, Idaho. Then, for 36-year-old Sharon Krista McAuliffe of Concord, New Hampshire, the dream came true. It's not often that a teacher is at a loss for words. I know my students wouldn't think so. I've made nine wonderful friends over the last two weeks. And when that shuttle goes, they might be one body. <laughs> but there's going to be ten souls that I'm taking with me. This is home in New Hampshire, all spruced up for Krista's return, despite the fact that five-year-old daughter Caroline doesn't like the whole business. Because I don't want her to go in space because I just want to stay around my house. Husband Steve heard the news on the radio. Everybody who knows her, I think, honestly thought that, you know, there, there may have been candidates who were certainly her equal, but that there was nobody that would be superior to her. McAuliffe has already had a taste of what space flight will be like. This was a ride in a plane that simulates zero gravity. She'll now go through 114 hours of intensive training. That's, of course, a fraction of what astronauts go through, but enough so she can get along as she takes the flight and records her thoughts in a journal. What, she was asked, does she look forward to most? Seeing the Earth, seeing the perspective of the Earth, and just being able to um, see the planet. I mean, you see it in pictures, but be able to see that in reality it's going to be wonderful i do plan to go back to teaching this is not a career but it's an unbelievable experience dan molina nbc news washington and apparently it uh, was her last experience because although we have no confirmation there is no indication whatsoever that there were any survivors in the crash today of the space shuttle challenger uh, two minutes downrange, about four and a half miles up uh, up in the air 
John Palmer is in New York now. John? Yes, Tom. Some of the first uh, rescue teams have apparently arrived on the scene or very near the scene where there was the splashdown of at least the large pieces of the Space Shuttle Challenger and the rocket boosters. Uh, they report back that no significant pieces uh, of the shuttle have been found in the water. There is no evidence of any survivors. One theory that is being looked at, we are told, as just a theory by NASA, is that there could have been a rupture in the seam. And Tom, you alluded to this a few minutes ago when they went to a full power at about one minute into the flight. There could have be a, been a rupture of the seam from the, uh, the spacecraft and the solid uh, ro uh, booster rocket that right at this point there could have been a tearing when the rocket went into great acceleration, its fastest point. But of course that is, uh, is mere projection or, or supposition at this point, but it's something we're told they're looking into. And earlier, as we have mentioned, there was a delay of a couple of hours down at the Cape for the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger. Uh, this because of icicles that appeared on the body of the spacecraft because it was below 32 degrees this morning in Florida. They uh, talked about that a while. They even removed some of those icicles. They were greatly concerned that during liftoff, some of these icicles might break off and, and damage some of those very sensitive tiles on the spacecraft, tiles that are needed for re-entry. But they knocked off some of those icicles. They really didn't think it was any great uh, concern to worry about. There's one other thing that observers at the Cape noticed uh, that was a bit different about the liftoff of this flight, and that was observers say it seemed to be a slower liftoff than they had ever seen before. I was watching it live, and it seemed to me, I thought, in fact, I set out, uh, set out loud to a group who were watching it with me, I, there must have been a shutdown here. There seemed to be uh, uh, an interminably long time before uh, actually it cleared the pad. Uh, that uh, will not be supposition very long because they have all the data there in the computers to, to check that out. But a number of theories are, uh, are being considered at this point. Tom? Thank you, John. Uh, well, it's not unusual for it to look as if it's lifting off very slowly, and of course all the telemetry, all the signals that NASA said it had at that point were normal, so we don't know whether that in fact had anything to do with it. The big external tank, however, is itself a very thin-skinned um, vessel is really what it is. It holds all that oxygen and hydrogen, and when they do separate, it just breaks up. They don't recover that. They recover the the two solid rocket boosters which are on either side. So it is something that could come apart without too much difficulty. Bob Bazell, who's been covering the space shuttle program since its inception now, is at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Bob, you and I have been talking about this business of going up in the space shuttle because we both have been applicants under the journalist program. And we've been talking about what was required. Tell me a little bit about what the people in Houston and really at uh, Cape, uh, Cape Canaveral have said to you about what is required in terms of the kind of people that they will put in that cockpit. Well, interestingly enough, Tom, the space shuttle program was said before today's uh, tragedy to have evolved to the point that almost anybody could have gone up. In fact, one astronaut told me that all you really need to go know to go up in the shuttle is how to get out in a hurry that's on the ground, and let's get back to that in a minute, and how to use the toilet in the air. And other than that, it was supposed to be a program where just people could be passengers. Now, it is interesting, I think we should probably talk again, as you were mentioning before, about what the emergency procedures were, because I think the people who aren't as familiar with it, who haven't been watching it that closely, might not understand. There was no emergency escape uh, exit uh, ejection capsule anymore on the shuttle. There was, as you mentioned, as Senator Garn mentioned, in the early days of the program, there were ejection seats for the pilot and the co-pilot. But as the number of people in the crew began to grow, as the, some of them began to ride downstairs, NASA decided that that was just impractical, and they concentrated on two ways of escaping. One is if something went wrong on the ground, they would scramble out and go down a wire. The other thing was if, if something happened in the air, they would try to land it either back at a runway at the Cape or, as you mentioned before, to go on to Spain or to try to go once around the world and land at Edwards Air Force Base. So those were the only methods of escape. Now, it appeared from those, the tape that we've looked at over and over again that there was such an explosion that it wouldn't have mattered what kind of precautions they had. It's also interesting to point out, and where everything, we, as we keep saying, is speculative at this point, that as you also mentioned, that the external fuel tank that contained that massive amounts of liquid hydrogen and oxygen and essentially a gigantic bomb, uh, is the only part of the space shuttle that's not reusable. So each time they go up, they have a new one. So if we were looking at something that possibly had a, uh, a defect, that could have been it. Bob, we're going to look at the tape now once again in slow motion. And this is one minute and 15 seconds downrange. There is the explosion. As you can see, it was massive. It's very difficult to see from the, the extent of the explosion what might have been involved because obviously the flames just, yeah encompassed everything. You see one of the solid rocket boosters going off to the right, Bob. That's right. That seemed to stay intact, but the rest, right. the, the main vehicle seemed to go just to pieces in a hurry. Right. 
It was interesting that uh, the recovery teams couldn't enter the area because debris kept falling for 15 minutes after the explosion. That was how much debris there was. I suppose if there's anything to be hoped for, that it was instantaneous. I suppose that's about it. It's inter it was obviously tragic to look. It was obviously tragic to look at those pictures of uh, Christy McCullough and uh, his family. But we should remember that there were six other people who had families on there as well. And you and I, uh, Tom, know Judy Resnick, uh, one of the astronauts who was on board. As I mentioned before, Dick Scobie was a good friend, uh, somebody who had predicted to me that someday some tragedy like this would happen. So we have six families as well as Christy McAuliffe's yeah, uh, we, watching we, this tragedy today. Absolutely. We don't want to overlook that. Uh, these are, on the other hand, people who know the risks as they go in. They go in... Uh, as volunteers and they are taught what the risks are as they go along. There is the crew that you saw today with Dick Scobie in the middle uh, and it is a tragedy of enormous proportions. There are just too few ways to say it, frankly, uh, except in our own minds. Uh, we've all watched this space program for 25 years now and uh, we've had just three deaths prior to this, but now it appears that seven more today, and it is something which our national pride is all wrapped up in one form or another, and of course we do feel an attachment to these people, not just to the school teacher, but to the astronauts. They're part of America's folk heroes at this time in our lives. At Cape Canaveral, Steve Delaney standing by at the Kennedy Space Center. Steve? You were talking a moment ago about watching the space program for 25 years. Jay Barbary has been covering it for NBC radio and occasionally television for a good deal longer than that. You've seen death here before, you've seen explosions before. You were here when that little grapefruit-sized thing blew up back about, what, 57, the first time we tried to get something up in the air. It was December the 6th, right, 57. And in all that time, you probably have learned more about how these things work and why they're so careful than anybody else. What, uh, what does that, all that knowledge lead you to today in terms of trying to figure out what did happen here? Well, Steve, it's difficult to understand that it could have happened because uh, all of these systems are fed through computers before they lift off and all the computers have to write them off have to say everything is fine in fact the flight controllers in Houston they were saying that everything was fine no, no one saw anything but as we look at the videotape as it goes back it's apparent what happened was that the explosion started at the base of the huge external fuel tank. And you that have big to... silo thing right. that the, and, and the space vehicle sits on it like a butterfly on a tree stump. That's right. It's hanging beneath it. They're going into orbit underneath it this time. Now, the ducts that come out of the big tank feed into the engines. And uh, I believe we're getting ready to look at it now. No, we just well, did. we just missed it. Anyway, they feed into the engines. Yeah. And it appeared from what we can see on the videotape that that's where the explosion began. Something happened there in the big ducts going from the tank into the engines themselves. And it was right after Dick Scobie was told to go for throttle up, which means they have passed through the maximum dynamic pressure and they're ready to start feeding more right. throttle. So they're up through most of the atmosphere and they're heading for outer space at that right. point then. And, and your, your, your look at that suggests to you that it was indeed that big liquid fuel bomb that, uh, that took out the rest of it in just an instant uh, as they were getting back into high gear to climb out right uh, climb out of the top that's exactly what happened and then the two solids went off to the side we watched those we yeah. saw them continue well, to burn. we did see that now where does this program go from here is this a crippling or or, or a, a slow down blow it's definitely a slow down blow they had uh, scheduled 15 launches this year 13 from here two from vandenberg the, sh the shuttle none of them will fly again until right. Jay, let me ask you about the recovery effort. You're familiar with the kinds of things that they put out over the water, and, and, and you used to do it in drills all the time. Mm -hmm. What happens if we have to drop into the water? Well, there, there are recovery vehicles. But with all that water and, and bits of debris raining down for 15 minutes after the explosion, what do you expect them to come back with? Well, I expect a core of some sort of the vehicle is on the bottom of the Atlantic now, and possibly the bodies of the seven crew members are in that cabin. And if it was not far enough, they say it's 18 miles east of here, it's not off the continental shelf, then it is in water that is shallow enough that they can go, they can retrieve the bodies. But I think this is what they're looking at at this time. They're hoping at least a core of the vehicle did remain. However, we did not see anything but a lot of debris coming down. The two pieces that you see on the videotape, the largest pieces that remain, were the two solid booster rockets. All right, so you should, you would have expected if the 
orbiter, if the Challenger came down intact, you would have expected to see it, at least in that long-range television shot, after the explosion. That's correct, Steve. And you did not? Nobody I did, did not see it. I don't no. think anyone did. Tom, this is your best chance to ask a question of the man who knows more about all this than anybody else. He's, uh, he's oh, here. He has to go back on the radio. Jay, we've been down there a lot uh, together and uh, separately. Uh, there was no indication whatsoever that they were going to have any trouble with this launch today. No was there any feeling going on at, uh, at the Kennedy Space Center that, in fact, that they may have been pushing the civilian program a little too rapidly? The question is, were, were they getting the civilian flight uh, uh, personnel too quickly? Well, Tom, I don't want to be unfair to the people here, but the thing that you have to realize is that they were going for 15 shots this year, and a lot of the old hands that were here through Mercury, through Gemini, through Apollo, that uh, guarded this mission, that were very careful, they made sure that everything was absolutely correct before they flew, they're gone. It's a new face that's in here today that's flying the shuttle, and they are doing them. They are talking about doing 24 a year and even 36 a year, and they're gearing up to flying with two pads to flying these four, four uh, spacecraft at all times, keeping them in the air. So there was a little sense of, yes, you are rushing it too fast. But again, we go back to the fact that the computers okayed it all. Everybody okayed it all. Okayed it, all. it was good until it went bad. It was good until it went bad. And no one knows what happened. And who can say that if they were flying six months apart, that this would not have happened? Jay, thank you. Tom, uh, we don't know any more now than we did approximately an hour and a half ago when we first began to understand the scope of all this. When we do, I guess we'll be back. Thank you very much, Steve Delaney and Jay Barbary at uh, Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral, Florida today. And with me now here in our Washington studios is Marcia Smith. She's the executive director of the National Commission on Space. It's a presidential commission. Yes, it is. The future of space does not look very promising this afternoon, Ms. Smith. Well, this certainly has been a terrible tragedy. We're not sure quite what the implications are going to be for the long-term future right now. It depends on what the problem was, what caused it. But wouldn't you expect that there would be a public outcry for the shuttle program to shut down for a good long time until they're absolutely certain that all the glitches are out of it? We've had delay on launch now. We've had weather problems, of course, that have caused some of that. But there have been little problems along the way. And now, tragically, a seven-person crew has been lost. I hope that there is not a national outcry to shut the shuttle program down. And I'm quite confident that NASA would not launch again until it was quite certain that there was no danger to its crew. So I think that NASA will follow the procedures that it has established for these types of tragedies as they did at the Apollo fire back in 1967. I'm sure that it will be quite a long time before we see another shuttle launch, but I hope that the public does not suddenly turn against the manned space program. Conceptually, has the United States had too much of its investment in the shuttle program and not enough in other space programs? As you well know, there are people who are interested in space saying, too much money is being spent on the shuttle and not enough on other scientific research programs. Well, actually, the percentage of the space science budget, which is the, the people who normally complain about that are the space scientists, and the percentage of the space science budget relative to the rest of the NASA budget has actually remained fairly constant throughout the entire history of the space agency. Now, that's beginning to change now because the operations costs of the space shuttle have become so large and space science programs are now getting cut back. But I don't think it would be fair to say that too large of a percentage is being devoted to the man program. We are in a numbers crunch in terms of the budget in this country right now with Graham Rudman and uh, yes, other programs yeah. coming along to cut things back. Uh, the space shuttle program was supposed to be self-sustaining at some point. That is, the private enterprise would be able to carry the load because of the experience that were conducted in outer space. That now has been delayed. So there's going to be a real budget crunch, isn't there, for the space program? It's unclear. A lot of the budget costs in NASA's budget are for operating the shuttle. If we don't have shuttle flights for a year or so while they're investigating this accident, then that money it may go into redesigning whatever piece of equipment went wrong on this flight. But it could be in that sense, you know, as terrible as this was, that may be one result of it, that NASA does not have to spend so much money on shuttle operations in the near-term future. I would not think that that would last very long, however, so I don't think it will have much effect on the split between the unmanned and the manned programs. Do you think that uh, as a society that we've just become too sanguine about uh, space and, and space launches that uh, we think that nothing can go wrong because they always seem to go right? Well, I think that NASA has a very impressive record on manned and unmanned launches and perhaps we become a little too complacent. These things are dangerous. The astronaut crews certainly recognize it. It's a risk they're willing to take. Marsha Smith, thank you very much for being thank with you. us. Thank you. Um, it's hard to know at this time, of course, what the political fallout is likely to be, but my guess is that one result of this explosion today on the shuttle program is that the critics of the President's Strategic Defense Initiative, the SDI or Star Wars program, 
We'll use this as one more example of how, just how wrong things can go in space and that you can't count on a Star Wars or SDI kind of program as a fail-safe defense against an incoming nuclear attack. So that will be part of the equation as well. Here's what happened today, about one minute and 15 seconds at about five miles up, a downrange about 18 miles from the Kennedy Space Center. Here is the launch once again. For those of you who are just joining us, Solid uh, rocket booster engine gimbal now underway. T minus 15 seconds. That's the external tank, the orange tank that you see in the background. And we believe, based on our own speculation, that that may have been the source of the problem. It fuels those engines. Those are the main engines at the bottom of the spacecraft, which is a kind of engine with short, uh, an airplane with short wings. Everything is normal here. The 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Roll program. Challenger. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. I'm waiting. I got the rest of the, the, the insurance. Engines beginning throttling down now. Those are the That's solid rocket boosters, the long white Normal rockets on uh, either side. They are supposed to separate and then they are recovered via parachute and the plane, the space shuttle itself, goes on into orbit under normal conditions. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. APUs are auxiliary power units. Engines at 65%. 57 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles. Downrange distance 3 nautical miles. Now he's going to tell him to go to full throttle. And that's when it happens. Engines throttling up. Three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance, 7 nautical miles. And there it was. An eerie, tragic beauty in the skies over Florida today. Tragedy of enormous proportions. Seven people killed, we believe. Their families obviously deeply affected as is the nation, as is the space program. Here it is in slow-mo. It's hard to imagine that anyone could have survived that. The only solid piece of debris we see is the solid rocket booster off to the side. There were no astronauts in that, of course. The space shuttle Challenger itself seems to have come apart. Debris fell into the ocean. Recovery uh, vessels were quickly in place, but they couldn't enter the recovery area because the debris continued to fall. They're there now. We've not heard how they're doing at this point. We do expect Senator John Glenn in the Senate gallery within no oh, five minutes or so. Of course, Senator Glenn is a veteran astronaut. He was the first American to make an orbital flight of the Earth back in the early days of the space program and the Mercury capsule. Um, John Palmer is in New York with additional information for us. John? Yes, Tom. The Soviet news agency TASS has now made mention of this. Just a one line on it. The U.S. Space Shuttle Challenger exploded shortly after takeoff today. There is no comment. The Soviet Union, of course, is the only other country that has sent uh, people up into space. And the Soviet Union has, of course, reported the death of four Soviet cosmonauts. Prior to today, three uh, American uh, astronauts had lost their lives. Uh, there is this word, according to a spokesman for Lloyd's of London, all of the crew members of the shuttle flights are offered the opportunity for life insurance, uh, written by Lloyd's of London, and a spokesman for Lloyd's of London says that only, uh, only one of the astronauts, and uh, that was Krista McAuliffe, the school teacher, took advantage of that life insurance. She took out a policy of $1 million on her life. She, along with the other six members of the Space Shuttle Challenger, now presumed to have been lost. Uh, shortly after 11.30 this morning when the Space Shuttle Columbia exploded about a minute after launch from Cape Canaveral. Let's go back now to Washington and Tom Brokaw. Tom? Thank you, uh, John Palmer. Um, there is a problem, and we hope before the afternoon is out, to deal with some people who will be here to help you as you deal with your children. We hope to have a child psychologist, because a lot of children have been watching the space program, including the students of Krista McCall. Now at the Senate Gallery on Capitol here, Capitol Hill, Senator John Glenn. But uh, 
the people that were on the flight today carried our hopes and dreams along with them and they'll live forever in our memories and I guess that's the best tribute we can give to them the uh, our prayers our sympathy our condolences go out to their families and friends and uh, I guess that's about all we can say about them right at this time it's been an amazing success story up to this very tragic accident today. I think this was about the 56th or 57th manned mission where we're dealing with new complexities and speeds and, and powers that man has never used before. And uh, we had hoped to push this day back forever, but that was not to be. And we all, I guess, intuitively knew that. So today we don't want to repeat, that's for sure. Senator, what effect does this have on a space program or any sort of flight test program when something like this happens? Oh, it delays things, of course, because uh, there will be a very complete investigation. Our view of what happened uh, this morning would be only speculation at this point, although the very slow motion pictures I saw on one of the channels a little while ago seem to show the first light coming out of uh, one of the solid rocket cases. Uh, whether that'll turn out to be the cause of the difficulty or not, I don't know. But I wouldn't think that this was, uh, you know, what it'll do to the program or how much it'll be set back will be dependent on the investigation. Was NASA trying to push too hard on this, Senator? No, I don't think so. If there's one thing NASA has not done all the way through, uh, it is uh, take a chance on cutting corners uh, and we've grown accustomed to success and it's been an amazingly successful program so far you know I remember one of the TV commentators I won't say which network but one morning talking about when there was a delay commenting when are we gonna get this this Turk turn this turkey into an eagle uh, we'd become so accustomed to getting these things off on time that safety was obviously being, uh, at least in that commentator's mind, uh, was being given uh, short shrift. Why aren't we running these things like a regular airline schedule? Well, the fact that NASA has not done that. They've run it with the idea of safety first and foremost, and that's been the way it's been operated ever since the days when I was in that program many years ago. It's a tribute to them that they have not been goaded under pressure to taking any chances. And we'll just have to wait the, the accident analysis to see what happened in this case. Senator, were you watching the blast off this morning? I was not. I was in a classified briefing at the time, and uh, one of my uh, staff people uh, brought a note in to me about this, and then I left immediately and went up to my office. What was your reaction, particularly to the replays you've probably seen? Oh, my reaction was a profound sense of loss, I guess, that this day had finally come that we'd hoped would never arrive. In some ways, I guess it's, uh, you know, in, in our human existence, I, let me be philosophical for a moment. I guess in our human existence, there is triumph and there is tragedy. And uh, man tries many things. And uh, we advance as a whole human race because we, because we succeed most of the time. We make advances, whether it's in space or engineering or health or medical things. Sometimes, though, we aren't perfect. And then there's a tragedy that uh, brings us back to our own human frailties and our, our lack of perfection. And so that's the kind of a day we're faced with now. It's been an amazingly succe successful series of triumphs through the years. But it also is fraught with the possibility of tragedy, and that's what we came up against today. When you say that this was a day that was pushed back for safety, was it inevitable that it would finally come? Well, I think, any, uh, I think everyone that's ever had any connection with the program has felt that uh, someday there would be a, a loss in flight. Uh, we're dealing with tremendous powers and speeds. You're traveling in orbit at five miles a second and trying to get back into the atmosphere from that kind of speed. And so uh, are we going to be perfect forever? I guess the answer was proven this morning that the answer to that is no. 
but uh, that doesn't mean that man doesn't keep trying in these areas and that we're not just as dedicated to seeing that this kind of research goes on. Senator, you've been, you've been part of a small and very select community of people, the community of astronauts. What does this do to that community when something like this happens? Well, we've never had something like this happen before, except for the uh, pad fire, that, or the, uh, the fire on the pad that claimed three lives, uh, Gus Grissom, Ned White, and Roger Chafee back in uh, 67, I believe it was. Uh, so we went through that uh, tragedy then, but that was not an in-flight accident. Uh, obviously, uh, there will be uh, a, a shared sense of loss in the whole astronaut group and community. Everybody associated with the whole program, whether astronauts or all those in the, in the supporting functions. Uh, but I'm sure their dedication is going to be to, to uh, find out what caused this and correct it and get on with the next flight. Do, do astronauts just simply accept this as part of the job? I think any time you go into flying or test flying, or uh, which many all of us were in in the prior to being in the astronaut program early on, uh, you accept risks, but you feel that the risks are worth it for the country and the importance of what you're doing, and you're willing to take those risks. And uh, that's the way we looked at it back then. That's the way I'm sure all of the current group of astronauts looks at it. How much more of a tragedy is this since it was the first launch of a citizen in space? loss of human life doesn't have much to do with who's military and who's civilian. It's a tragedy for their friends and families, and I don't differentiate between the loss of life, whether it was the regular flight crew or whether it was a civilian on board with them. How, how much does it set back the Citizen in Space program, do you think? Uh, I don't know. I have no way of knowing at this point. They had lined up uh, some other people to go, of course. Whether this will affect that or not, I don't know. Do you think it should? Does this raise questions for the SDI program? No, I don't think so, because the, the uh, technologies that were being used here as far as thrust and the engines and whatever happened here, I think probably are not likely to affect the research going on for lasers and laser projection and, and uh, formable mirrors and, uh, and particle beam projection and things like that. I would not think, I would not think it likely that there was an, a connection there. Senator, are you concerned now, or have you ever been concerned about the way NASA procures parts? No, I never have. Uh, NASA has bent over backwards to be as safe as they possibly can be. And whether this will prove to be a, uh, a one-time difficulty uh, from whatever cause, or whether it will be a design defect, that is uncovered now that we can correct or whatever, we'll have to await analysis, but there's no way of knowing right now, uh, just now a couple of hours after the accident to know what happened. Senator, thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator John Glenn at the uh, Capitol Hill uh, Press Gallery. Senator Glenn, of course, a veteran of the NASA Astronaut Corps. He talked quite eloquently, it seems to me, about the price of advancing human knowledge sometimes requires the sacrifice of human lives, and he spoke uh, with great feeling as well about what appeared to be the deaths of the astronauts today. To his practiced eye, it did appear that the trouble may have uh, emanated from one of the solid rocket boosters on either side of the space shuttle itself. The rest of us who've been looking at it thought that it might have come from the external tank. We don't yet have any official confirmation from NASA if, in fact, the space agency knows itself what may have happened there. There was an accumulation of ice on a very cold Florida morning today around the base of the shuttle where the main engines are situated. We're going to show that to you now, but everything indicates that there was nothing wrong at the time of liftoff today at 1138 Eastern Time. They had been worried about whether earlier on, in, terms, in, in case they had to make an emergency landing at the Cape, they were, there were stiff winds yesterday, for example. This is the ice that accumulated at that time. Uh, whether that had anything to do with it, we don't know. We're just trying to show you as much as we possibly can about what was going on there before this accident today, before this terrible tragedy. For those of you just joining us, it appears that all seven astronauts aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger were lost when it blew up. Uh, about one minute and 15 seconds into its flight at an altitude of about five and a half miles altogether. Krista McAuliffe, the school teacher from Concord, New Hampshire, was on board. Her husband and two children were watching at the time, along with her parents and members of her third grade class carrying a banner that said, Go, Krista, go. Frame by frame now, this is what happened. 
That is the shuttle at the bottom half of the rocket apparatus. Now the explosion begins. It's very hard to tell, but it does seem to me that it did not happen within that solid rocket booster on this side of the spacecraft. It could have happened, of course, on the other one. But there is the possibility as well that it might have happened with the external tank. That is the big tank, and we're going to repeat some of this for those of you who are watching us uh, continually here because we know that people are just joining us along the way. But that big orange tank is, in effect, a bomb. It is a large vessel carrying 560,000 pounds of highly volatile oxygen and hydrogen. It feeds the fuel to the main tanks which are at the bottom of the space shuttle itself and as they went to full throttle from 65 percent power to full throttle 104 percent it was very shortly after that that the explosion occurred so it does appear that there may have been some connection between going to full throttle and the explosion itself and given the size of the explosion and the fact that we saw one of the uh, solid rockets peel off to the side it appears that that's where it may have happened at the white house now deputy press secretary larry speaks Home the State of the Union addressed that was scheduled for this evening. He will address the Congress and the American people on next Tuesday. The President, in addition, has asked the Vice President to go immediately to Cape Canaveral's Kennedy Space Center along with the acting NASA Director, Bill Graham. The Vice President will carry with him the President's personal concern for those courageous Americans who were aboard the space shuttle. In addition, the President will speak to the American people from the Oval Office later this evening regarding this tragedy. The President, since learning of the tragedy shortly before noon, has conferred with Don Regan, who in turn consulted with Speaker Tip O'Neill and Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole. They concurred in the President's decision to delay his State of the Union. A few moments ago, the President met in the Oval Office with NASA Director Graham and instructed him to fly to the Cape with the Vice President uh, to begin an effort to find out the cause of this tragedy. And then the President said to go forward with the nation's space program. The President said, and I quote, these people were dedicated to the exploration of space. We could do no more to honor them, these courageous Americans than to go forward with the program. Can you tell us some of the reasoning and the decision to postpone, since as you know, the President's first reaction was to go ahead with tonight's speech? I think the President, like all Americans, has seen this tragedy unfold on television and has felt keenly uh, what those family members must have felt watching that shuttle go into the air at, uh, at the Cape, first Pride and then second Hara. Um, the president feels that these same emotions are being experienced by people all over this nation at this moment. Uh, and with the con consultation of Congress that's taken place in the last hour or so, the president thought it was entirely appropriate that uh, his State of the Union uh, be deferred um, until uh, uh, and let him address the American people on what's happening here. Did Administrator United. Graham tell him finally what happened? Does he have information, confirmation? No, the, um, the uh, NASA has issued a statement indicating simply that there was an explosion aboard the space shuttle shortly after it lifted off uh, from the Cape this morning and that a search and rescue mission is underway. Uh, that is continuing at this hour and will, un will continue uh, until uh, all efforts to uh, uh, to find out uh, what the situation in there are exhausted. Does the president Please. believe? Right. Oh, right. Larry, is the president also going to cancel his State of the Union activities for the balance of the weekend? What time is the uh, other remarks? The uh, the president will um, this uh, will for the balance of the week continue on his. Uh, previously announced schedule with the exception of those activities which were designed as a follow-up to the State of the Union. They will be rescheduled for next week. The time of the address uh, to the nation has not been determined 
uh, pending definite word from NASA about the situation. HHS, Treasury, and the high school, he is not going to visit now. That's right. Larry, Larry, the phone, Larry. Larry can you Let's tell go us, one at a time. Does the president have any plans to... Uh, uh, travel or uh, uh, attend any memorial service for the... Uh, well, at the moment, they're, uh, you know, the NASA is still conducting its search uh, mission there, and, of course, there's been no memorial service set. The vice president does go with, uh, with the personal expression of the part of the president of his concern uh, to those families there, and uh, no, no travel plans are set as yet. All right. All right. Two questions. First of all, I know you haven't had any official word, but is the White House operating on the basis that all of the people on the shuttle are dead? Well, Chris, um, like every American, we hope. And um, until we find out otherwise, that hope will continue. And, and secondly, to, to follow up on an earlier question, we were told by the president uh, a few moments ago that, that he intended to go ahead with the State of the Union. In fact, said while it, it would cast a pall, the business of governing the nation must go on. Uh, what changed his mind in really a very short period of time? Well, as I indicated to your colleague over here just a moment ago, is that the, uh, the president, uh, like all Americans, watched this on television, uh, and his, he, he felt very keenly the emotion that must be felt by the families of those down there and that had to watch this event on, in person, and very keenly what the American people must be feeling. He consulted with the congressional leadership and the consensus opinion, of the executive and the legislative branch was that it was appropriate to postpone. Larry, so, can you tell us what uh, information the president is getting other than from television at this point? Well, as I just said, the president has conferred with the, with the director of uh, uh, NASA, and he brought him uh, up to date, providing him with as much information as he can. There is not an extensive body of information at the moment that, uh, that exists. Uh, NASA is looking into it as quickly as they can, and as I say, a, a search mission goes on. Is there now a special listen. task force either at the White House or somewhere that's keeping him informed, or are there special communications channels set up? As uh, as is always, when there is an event of this nature uh, that occurs uh, anywhere around the world, the White House Situation Room keeps on top of the events. What happened was, as soon as uh, this event occurred, almost simultaneously with the television coverage of it, uh, the Situation Room was informed by NASA and has uh, kept abreast of it with an open line uh, to NASA at the Cape uh, since that time. Was this well, I was going to uh, go back again on where the idea of postponing the speech uh, first initiated. Did the, the president idea, initiate yes, the idea? Yes, the president initiated the idea of postponing the speech. All right. <coughs> Right. Will the shuttle program be suspended at least until the investigation is through? Those determinations have not been made. The president indicated uh, to Bill Graham that he should find out the cause of it and then proceed. Now, uh, exactly how that dovetails with, with future flights uh, will just have to be determined as a result of what NASA determines in their investigation. Also, on the uh, consideration of whether any civilians will be permitted to continue on, on shuttle flights, is that also part of the investigation? Well, uh, to, to, uh, to, to echo the President's words that, uh, that all of these people were Americans, they were all interested in space, they all came uh, first with courage and second in a, in a spirit of volunteering for this mission, and uh, whether that uh, there'll be any change in that, I don't know. But at the moment, I don't think there's any in inclination. Joe? Has the president attempted to contact the family members of anyone who was on the show? The president has not yet done that, no, except to send the vice president uh, in, 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 in expression of his concern. Is there any feeling here that NASA was pushing too hard? There was a very ambitious program. Was it 15 launches for this year? Uh, I think NASA uh, has a a very good record of, uh, of safety and a very cautious uh, human approach to space exploration. And they have taken those precautions. Uh, this is a, a, a tragedy of major proportions uh, and one that concerns us all. But uh, for the moment, uh, uh, there, is no, um, uh, there is no finger pointing uh, at NASA as far as uh, their safety record. I mean, the question arises particularly because in recent uh, launches there have been some glitches that have come up. Uh, uh, as you know, they had a problem with the door, the hatch on this, and the uh, drill wouldn't work and, and all of that. 
Does that not give the impression that they may be pushing too fast? I am. Um, I, I can't make that judgment from here, but I think if you would look back at, at other space, space launchers in the Mercury and Apollo program, you would find that there have been postponements. These, uh, these not because of, of, uh, of glitches, but because of an extensive safety program that finds these glitches before launch. Can you be more specific about what the Vice President will be doing uh, later today, specifically, and also the, the postponement on the State of the Union pushed back the schedule for the budget and other things that were scheduled for next week? The, um, the, the Vice President's schedule, once he arrives at the Cape, has not been determined since it's just within the last few moments that uh, the President uh, has asked him to go down. Well, what's his specific charge? I mean, when his you say specific he charge, once again, is to express the President's concern to the families and to, uh, to accompany the Director of NASA uh, uh, down to the Cape in order to see that, uh, um, that the President's directions for an immediate uh, look into the uh, tragedy, into the explosion, is accomplished. Is he, so, is a, is he overseeing an investigation into this? I don't think uh, that you can say that uh, yet, Norm. I think this matter is entirely in the in the hands of the um, of the NASA people at at the present time, and I, I don't know of any. There's there's no further planning beyond that. Question on the budget um, that has not been determined. It would be uh, my inclination to say that the budget will probably go up on on Wednesday with the State of the Union on Tuesday. I think the Graham Rudman law requires that it go up by February 5th and that they will do. Andrew, and then I'm going to go all the way to the back and work forward. I just want to follow on Norm. Is it the President's view that perhaps an independent investigation uh, outside of NASA is what is required on the pacing every, of the program? And I think everyone might... everyone is, is leapfrogging uh, well ahead of, uh, of events uh, at present. Uh, this tragedy is now only hours old. Um, you have a series of actions taken by the president, including a charge to the director of NASA to find out what happened. And until uh, we do some preliminary studies, none of these questions have answers. So, Pat? Has the decision been made to have the president officially disclose tonight in his speech what happened? Or will, will we continue to get details from NASA throughout the day, or are they going to hold the president's speech? NASA will, will continue to keep abre you abreast of everything as they know it, as they always have through the entire history of the American space program. So, John? Larry, you made a point of saying early on that there would be no greater way to honor the, uh, those who uh, apparently have died in this mission than to continue on with the space program. Uh, <coughs> is this a, a deliberate effort to uh, try to counteract any uh, feelings against the program because of the tragedy? John, the only deliberate effort we're making at the moment is to show our deep concern, our deep emotion, and our desire that America continue in the space program. That's our entire motive, lock, stock, and barrel. Joanne? Uh, Larry, has the President expressed any rue or regret about his proposal to send civilians in space? The President is, is obviously concerned about uh, every person that he, as the chief uh, executive officer of the government, is he, as the President, directs. Uh, he directs people every day, uh, either directly or indirectly, uh, to conduct missions on the part of the, of the government, the military, NASA, and those. Uh, it's a fact of life when the man sits in the Oval Office. He has to make these decisions. And um, I have not heard him express any regret. Concern, yes. Deep emotion, yes. Sorrow, yes. Uh, but um, regret is not... Uh, is, is not that. It was the decision made, as he said, these individuals are all Americans, um, and they're all believers in the space program, and uh, that's what's in his mind. So, Walter? All right, does the president plan today to speak with any of the relatives, family of any of the... Uh, that hasn't been show? determined yet, no. Frank? Uh, can you give us any indication as to what the First Lady was doing uh, at the time that this information became available and what no. her reaction was? Then? I don't. We can, uh, we can check with her office, if you will, and see what we can, Larry, can get. Because the Europeans are able to put up s satellites in unmanned, uh, with unmanned vehicles, uh, doesn't this accident argue per se that unmanned vehicles are a preferable way to put up satellites in, in orbit? Uh, once again, uh, you know, I have been a a silent observer of the space program and not one that's actively involved and I'm not competent to answer that. All right. so. uh, as you recall, the president made the decision to send a teacher 
into space. Uh, can you tell us on what he based that decision and who suggested the timing and when the time was right for that uh, uh, Well, Mike, I, I don't want to come down hard on you, but, uh, but the, the, what's in the president's mind right now is to find out what happened and to show those families of those people that he's concerned. Um, and that's all that's on his mind at the moment. Um, are, are you operating on the assumption that this is the result of some technological problem? And or has, has anyone suggested the possibility it might be an act of terrorism? The, um, there have been no suggestions either way. Thank you. Larry speaks in the White House pre uh, press briefing room, uh, just completing that uh, live briefing to reporters who are assembled there. He made several major announcements. The President's State of the Union address tonight has been postponed until Tuesday of next week. Uh, the White House saying that the President initiated that decision. We also had word from Capitol Hill that both House Speaker Thomas P. Tip O'Neill and the Senate Majority Leader Robert Dole of Kansas concurred in that decision, that there were efforts being made up there even before the White House came to its decision that they ought to, in fact, postpone tonight's State of the Union address. The president, however, will address the nation tonight from the Oval Office. The time, as of now, undetermined. As soon as we have that time for you, of course, we'll bring it to you. Vice President Bush and the administrator of NASA will be dispatched to the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral, Florida today, where they will be the president's personal representatives to determine what has happened there. It has now been about two and a half hours since this tragedy occurred, this traumatic shock to the nation. Seven astronauts apparently lost in a gigantic explosion about five miles up in space, about one minute and 15 seconds after the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger today. It was witnessed by the parents, the husband, and the children of Krista McAuliffe, who is the school teacher, of course, riding along today, and apparently she has been lost. Also, members of her third grade class were there with a banner that read, Go, Krista, Go. In Concord, New Hampshire, the high school had been assembled in an auditorium, 1,500 altogether, to watch on television this launch. And across the country, for that matter, young people have been watching what happened today, and it's bound to have a traumatic effect on youngsters, as well as those of us who are grown-ups and think that we are used to the unexpected in life and find out that we are not. To help us uh, deal with all that now is Dr. Ravenscroft, Ken Ravenscroft, who is from Georgetown University. He's a child psychiatrist. Dr. Ravenscroft is the parent of youngsters. What would I say to them tonight as we discuss this around the dinner table? Well, I think one of the major things actually uh, is to find out, first of all, uh, to let them know you're aware of what's happened and then to find out from them what they've been through so far that day. Obviously, parents have to uh, react. They're stunned. They're in grieving. Uh, they are having whatever range of reactions they're having. And uh, I think it's healthy and natural to show that and to communicate it. Uh, some care, perhaps, not to overwhelm and to keep some reserve and attune attune themselves to exactly what their kids have been through that day. After the kids have seen this on television, we've shown it a number of times now because we have a rotating audience coming in and, and going out and so on. Would you as a parent say to your child, I just think you've watched it enough now and maybe it'd be a good idea to, to get away from the television set for a time? Well, I think that, uh, that overdoing it is going to uh, take time away from perhaps uh, what needs to be done, which is some containment and some support by the part of the parents. I think, though, it's not a time to get into major confrontations about something like this, but rather to be with them uh, with what they're doing, but also to make it clear you're available to talk about it. This thing is going to unfold over several hours, days, and weeks, and there's no real predicting how any given child, because each child is a different age and a different person, how they're going to react. So the key thing is to find out how they're processing it and dealing with it in order to be able to uh, to respond to that. And should you share your own vulnerabilities, your own feeling of shock and, and grief as well? I think that's, that's key. Uh, for many of these children, they haven't been through a tragedy of this magnitude and this level that really disrupts the, the sense of uh, trust in the world and parents and government and, and technology. Uh, these kids have grown up taking the, the shuttle now, perhaps many of them, for granted. And because of Krista, there is a heavy personal identification and immediacy to it that intensifies the whole thing and the focus. 
so that uh, parents who have been through this okay. kind of thing before, yep. I think, can model to some degree what it's like. And it's not modeling, it's genuine. Uh, you have this kind of effort, this kind of power involved in a technological effort, and as John Glenn just said, uh, we get to taking it for granted, and yet uh, there's bound to be something like this that's going to happen. And at that point, you realize that with great efforts and endeavors, tragedy can happen. It's an experience that's not only a common bond for the nation, but it is especially a common bond for families, for parents and children. Exactly. And to talk it out is the best thing. Yeah. Well, one key thing, uh, kids often, the younger kids, don't like to be put on the spot. Uh, they really would prefer not to be pressured. So the key thing is to ask them perhaps how their classmates reacted, how other people reacted, and through their indirect comments, you can really warm them up or get a sense of how they're reacting, and then at that point, maybe deal with it uh, from your own point of view. Dr. Ravenscroft, thanks very much for coming in today. Okay, thank you. In a sense, uh, the space program is one of the great common bonds of this country. In a way, we're all passengers on those flights when they go off, whether we're interested in the technology or not. You know, we, uh, we identify with the astronauts. They are, as I indicated earlier, our folk heroes. We know them. If not personally, we know them by reputation. And not as well as we did the original group, of course, but still, they are part of the folk war, folklore of American life. And therefore, when something like this happens, it's bound to affect all of us. John Palmer is in New York now. John? Right, Tom, we understand that NASA officials are going to hold a briefing at 3.30 Eastern time at the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral to give us the latest of their theories of what might have happened. And of course, we're waiting for any word that we can get at that point, 18 or 25 miles off the coast where the debris from the Space Shuttle Challenger went down to find out what they have found. The latest word we had about 45 minutes ago that they found no significant pieces of debris there, uh, no pieces of the Space Shuttle Challenger. And of course, they saw at that point no loss of life. We do uh, have learned that the, the House of Representatives is going to meet in special session this afternoon to pass a resolution of sympathy for the shuttle crew. And as we heard earlier, the President has canceled his State of the Union address tonight, but he will address the American people tonight uh, when he gets more details of what happened and the fate of the crew from NASA officials. And uh, he also, of course, said that he has dispatched to Vice President Bush immediately down to Cape Canaveral there to express condolences to members of the family, and he is being joined there by the acting uh, NASA Administrator Fred Graham. We want to now play once again the tape of uh, this tragedy to you. It occurred at 11.38 Eastern Time this morning after the launch had been delayed a couple of hours today because of some icicles. It finally got off the ground at uh, about uh, 11.38, and as you can see, it lifted off the pad very smoothly. There appear to be no difficulties whatsoever. But it was not long after that that fragments from the $1.2 billion spacecraft and the seven astronauts aboard until that fell into the ocean. There is doubt, of course, that any astronaut or person could survive. The explosion occurred as the Challenger was about 10 miles high, speeding toward orbit at 1,977 miles an hour. This is um, some members of the family of Krista McAuliffe, the school teacher from Concord, uh, New Hampshire, watching there at the stands. Her husband, Stephen, was also there, as well as her nine-year-old daughter. We're moving up now to the time. There's a very close-up picture of this uh, brilliant uh, flash in the sky, this explosion. The theory being, obviously, it had to do with one of the fuel tanks. Just what happened, nobody knows, but it could well have been the tearing of a seam that attaches the spacecraft itself to the main rocket engine. Uh, they are moving to the point of separation. The explosion occurred about 30 seconds before the solid booster rockets normally fall off, and you many times have seen that. Here is the close-up, and there is the explosion aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger happening about 11.39 Eastern Time, and you see now what appears to be one of the solid booster rockets. This again is the family. This is Christy McAuliffe, astronaut, uh, or rather teacher McAuliffe's family there. The, her mother, her father there, other members of the family. At, at first, they didn't know what was happening. Um, then it became clear when they said they, they had a major problem, and then the uh, communications people down at NASA at the Cape over the public relations or public address system stated that there had been an explosion, a tragedy indeed. 
It is the first uh, loss of American life uh, aboard uh, in flight, uh, aboard the shuttle or any other kind of air of spacecraft in flight. Of course, there was a tragedy back in January of 1967 when Virgil Grissom and two other astronauts died in a fire aboard an Apollo spacecraft. But since that time, there has been no loss of life until today when we can only but sadly presume that seven Americans, including the first school teacher, the first, if you will, regular person, uh, regular citizen uh, up in space apparently have been lost. Uh, one of the next flights was going to be to taking a journalist into space. As the program uh, was uh, very ambitious for this year, they hoped to send as many as 15 shuttle flights. There have been delays on the first one. There were delays uh, and uh, on this one also, several days of delays because of weather. One thing or another, you'll recall, yesterday the problem seemed to have been with a screwdriver that, uh, that delayed him for some time, and by that time the weather was not, uh, was not very favorable. This morning, there was, uh, the, the scheduled liftoff was 9.38 Eastern Time, but there was a problem there with the freezing temperatures overnight. It dropped uh, below the freezing point, and icicles developed on the main body of the spacecraft. That concerned the uh, officials at NASA a little bit, so they delayed the flight. They even sent some people there to chip off some of those icicles. Then they determined that it really wasn't going to be much of a problem. About 10 o'clock, it became above uh, the freezing point, and uh, they thought there would be no danger of the icicles uh, uh, during launch falling off and, and uh, hitting the protective shield, those tiles. So nobody knows at this particular time what the, what the problem was, but it is indeed uh, a tragedy of the, of the first magnitude in the space program. There's a lot of speculation that we've heard this afternoon of what this means to the space pro uh, program. Obviously, there's going to be a delay while uh, no launches ever, ever takes place. That's an old NASA rule until they find out what happened on the last one, even if it's a, just a minor glitch. And of course, we have more than a minor uh, glitch. We have a, a full-blown tragedy. Let's go back now to uh, Washington, D.C. and uh, Tom Brokaw. Tom? Thank you, John. Uh, Dan Molina is in Houston now, and we each have, I think, a model of the uh, space shuttle as it is attached to, to the two solid rocket boosters, which are on either side of it here. I'll turn it so that you can see. These are the solid rocket boosters, and this is the external tank that we've been talking about all day long. What appeared to happen is that something happened down here where it attaches to the shuttle itself, and it fuels these main engines, and it appears to our naked eye and not expert eye, although we've all been watching these for some time, it appears that that's where the explosion might have occurred just after these main engines were pushed forward to 104% or full throttle. They run at about 65% for the opening moments of the flight, up to about one minute, and then they push them forward so that they'll have enough to get into the orbit that they want to achieve. Under normal conditions, these two solid rocket boosters then would peel away and they would be parachuted back to Earth and this big external tank, which is a very thin-skinned vessel containing, as I indicated earlier, almost 600,000 pounds of hydrogen and oxygen, then that just breaks up and goes off into space. But uh, what happened today is that the entire system came apart. It exploded in a gigantic fireball. Dan Molina at Houston now, who is also, as I understand it, has one of these models. Dan, any further word down there, even speculation from some of the NASA officials? Tom, uh, interestingly, I had a conversation by phone about 20 minutes ago with uh, a man whose name is very, very well known in the NASA space program, Dr. Max Fage. I know that name is familiar to you. Dr. Fage is well known as the father of the space shuttle. Dr. Fage is retired from NASA now, but he was the chief designer of the space shuttle. I called him at his office. Uh, he now works for a private consulting firm and uh, asked him what he thought, what his first impressions were. He said that unless something shows up on long-range telescopes or on telemetry, we may never know what happened. And Dr. Faget said that that would be the worst thing of all because there would be no way to push on from that point. I asked him, Tom, about the uh, fact that the explosion occurred, as you pointed out, at the point where they throttle up to 140% of the shuttle's capacity. He then said, and perhaps it is a revealing comment, he said, yes, that is a glaring coincidence. I asked him if there were any flaws historically that he could recall, any things that concerned him or his team as he designed the shuttle that could possibly have resulted in something like this. He said no, but he, he remembered again that that happened, the explosion happened at the moment when there is the most pressure on the shuttle. He called it highly loaded at that point, the point when if anything was to happen, it would be 
the uh, the most uh, disastrous result, and that, of course, was a disastrous result that we have seen. The uh, the uh, orbital flight testing program, that was the first four flights of the space shuttle. During those four flights, there was a lot of instrumentation, extra instrumentation on the shuttle, the shuttle Columbia, to measure these kinds of things, to measure the pressure at various points on the shuttle's fuselage, to, to measure how the fuel was going through those lines, properly, improperly, but they took most of that instrumentation off after the first four flights. As they took off the ejection seats that, uh, that in an emergency were planned to allow the, uh, the crew to eject from the shuttle into, into the water. But we, uh, one moment, Tom, we're hearing one announcement here. Beginning at 3.30 p.m. Uh, we're hearing a repeat of the announcement that there will be a press briefing this afternoon at 3.30 by uh, Jess Moore, who is the NASA Associate Administrator for the Space Shuttle Program. Uh, carrying on, the uh, ejection seats were removed because at that point they thought there was just no possibility of this serious a tragedy. No possibility in some people's minds, but in the astronauts' minds, Tom, as you have said, as Bob Bazell, Roy Neal has said this morning, if you talk to the astronauts, they knew that one day something serious would happen. They knew there was that possibility, as you have said, Tom, they're riding on a big bomb, a very, very powerful bomb, the most complex machine ever built, and they knew something could happen. Today it did. Once more to review, as you were saying, Tom, for people may not remember exactly what the components of the shuttle are, these are the solid rocket boosters. They provide two million pounds of thrust. This, the huge external tank, and uh, the orbiter saddled on the outside of it. Tom? Thank you very much, Dan Molina. I had just uh, been talking with somebody recently, a friend of mine in New York who's watched a lot of the shuttle launches and never has fully understood just what does happen. This, in effect, becomes an airplane, a space airplane. After all this falls off, the shuttle then goes into launch. And as you can see, it looks like an airplane as I turn it to you. And then we see it land uh, often at uh, Edwards Air Force Base in California or at uh, the Kennedy Space Center, as they're now attempting to do. And all of that, that airplane and the crew sits right up here. It's a kind of a two-stage cockpit. That airplane is attached to all of this fuel. And so it is a highly volatile operation. What is also a volatile operation today is the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. Its headquarters here in Washington, D.C., and Robert Hager is standing by there now. Bob? Tom, this is an auditorium here at the headquarters where the civil servants who man the desks at NASA gathered uh, through the morning to hear this sad news from the Cape. Uh, they were stunned. They were shocked. As you said, the agency itself has been in some disarray. Uh, their budget for ongoing projects uh, coming in about $200 million less than they'd asked for. There were uh, $480 million believed to be cut from the upcoming budget uh, for the space station program, which the agency had hoped would be its next big, big uh, project. Uh, James Beggs, the former administrator, is now on a leave of absence uh, because of activities uh, in a, a prior job when he was at General Dynamics and was a vice president there and he's under indictment on a charge of defrauding the uh, the government so he had to step aside he is uh, as I say on a leave of absence so they have an acting administrator now in William Graham so he's a, a new man on the job although he's a longtime uh, confidant to the president and to the Reagan administration generally. So things were already in, in some disarray here, and this is, uh, beyond the human side of it, uh, going to be an administrative blow for NASA. Tom? Thanks. Uh, Robert Hager, who is uh, standing by in Washington and at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, now NBC News Chief Science Correspondent Robert Bazell who's been an applicant for the Journalist in Space program and has watched almost all of these liftoffs Bob, what are your thoughts about the future of NASA now? It is, as uh, Bob Hager indicated, a, an agency that is under considerable stress already. And on Capitol Hill this afternoon, they're talking about the budget constraints to replace this shuttle that blew up today cost more than $1 billion altogether. So NASA has problems that we can't even foresee at this time. Wouldn't you agree? Well, there certainly are. There's the problems associated with this immediate accident, which uh, will certainly have long-term effects, but there were problems before this accident, and it's important to keep them in mind that they were there before. And one of the problems is that the space shuttle program has cost an enormous amount of money, more than was originally predicted. It was supposed to have been paying for itself long ago. It has yet to come close to paying for itself. So there's been a lot of pressure on Capitol Hill and in other places to have more and more unmanned space pro uh, pro probes, uh, such as the 
Voyager uh, probe to distant planets that we've been covering here, but even to have more of the activities in orbit that the shuttle has been carrying out to be done by unmanned robots, because for a lot of these things, it looks wonderful when it works well that human beings are doing it, but in fact, it isn't necessary and it'd be a lot cheaper. There was that pressure on NASA beforehand, and there certainly is going to be more of that pressure now. All right, thanks very much. That's uh, Robert Brazell at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in uh, Pasadena, California, where he had been assigned to record one of the triumphs in space, the successful flight of the Voyager spacecraft, which just this past week has returned to Earth. Those remarkable pictures of the moons from Uranus. And the spacecraft, the Voyager now, is going on from there to take a look at Neptune. Back here on Earth, we're dealing with this enormous tragedy, the explosion of the space shuttle Challenger today about one minute and 15 seconds after it took off from the Kennedy Space Center with seven people on board, including, as we continue to point out, the school teacher, Krista McAuliffe, the first real civilian outside any governmental agency or governmental body to fly on the shuttle. And it appears that she was able to fly for only about one minute and 15 seconds. There has been no sign of survivors of any kind whatsoever. Small pieces of debris continue to rain down for about 40 minutes in a wide stretch of ocean off the east coast of Florida today. These are the people who are on board. We want to show them to you now and talk briefly as we can. The crew on board. Francis Richard Scobie was the pilot. He's uh, 46 years old. Scobie has logged more than 6,500 hours and 45 types of aircraft. And uh, he was the commander of this spacecraft today. Dick Scobie was a friend of Bob Bazell's and said to him recently, there's a possibility that one of these could blow up one day. Gregory Jarvis, a Hughes aircraft payload specialist also on board. He'd been waiting for years for mission. The payload specialists are the people who work with the experiments, of course. Forty-one years old. And Krista McAuliffe, the school teacher from Concord, New Hampshire, chosen in nationwide competition. Her husband and two children watching today along with her parents. She was 37 years old. Chris McAuliffe was to conduct Classrooms in Space. It was part of a program announced by President Reagan during the 1984 presidential campaign. Ronald McNair, 35 years old, one of the few black astronauts, was also on board today. He was a laser physics expert. He enjoyed what he called the fantasy of space. And this is Ellison Anazuka. Ellison Anazuka was the first Japanese American in space. He was on board, an Air Force major. He was a flight test engineer who took part in America's first manned military space flight. Judy Resnick, who had made an earlier flight. She helped pave the way for sexual equality for women in space. She was looking for a way to broaden her career as an electronics expert when she left her native Akron, Ohio, looking for the adventure of space. Enthusiastic. And this is Michael Smith, the 40-year-old shuttle co-pilot, a crack naval aviator and test pilot. They like nothing better than an afternoon of quiet woodworking or a quick game of squash. He had flown 28 different types of civilian and military aircraft, logging more than 4,200 hours of flying time, including 3,900 hours in jet aircraft the can-do crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger, now apparently lost in a tremendous fireball explosion out over the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Florida. Rescue crews continue to screen the area looking for whatever debris they can recover, any signs of life. So far, no word of any survivors. John Palmer's in New York. John? Yes, Tom, some stations along the line uh, may be leaving the network to do local programming. But we will, however, continue network coverage of this tragic event. We'd like to show you now two launches, the tragic launch today of the Space Shuttle Challenger and the launch back on January 12th of the Space Shuttle Columbia. That was the one that was delayed for some seven days, you'll recall. Here they are now, side by side, today's launch and the launch on January 12th of the Columbia. Some observers felt that today's launch was a little bit slower in getting off the pad. There's no real indication that uh, the computers show that to be true. But at this point, everything appears to be going well. Uh, both launches uh, look pretty much uh, the same. Mirror launches.
but as uh, this flight of the Challenger on your left, as it moves to one minute and about 15 seconds into the flight, there is the tragic explosion, the ball of fire, and then you see the pieces falling to earth. It was uh, almost an hour, uh, we think that time is about correct, uh, before they could get the, um, the ships in the area, the Coast Guard cutters, three of them, and a frigate, uh, and a hydrofoil launched along with paramedics and helicopters to that area because so much debris was falling down. Now we're getting very close to the point of the explosion. Again, obviously it was a fuel explosion. How it happened, nobody knows. And then there is that, uh, that painful mention uh, made by Dan Molina from one of the experts who helped design the shuttle that we may never know what happened. That, of course, would be very bad indeed as we go forward and if we go forward uh, in the sh space shuttle program as we are doing now. Now the close-up on your left, there is the explosion of the space shuttle Challenger this morning about 11.39 Eastern time and those two prongs moving out. One of them we can certainly identify as one of the solid rocket boosters, perhaps uh, the other is, and then you see all types of of debris raining down in what, Tom, you described a little earlier as kind of a strange beauty there, a blue sky. The launch took off this morning. Uh, the weather was very clear, a delay for just a couple of hours there because of the weather conditions. Uh, to recap, it, uh, it's been mentioned that uh, the president has delayed or canceled his State of the Union address for tonight. He's moved it for one week. The House will meet in session, and they will, of course, pay tribute to the astronauts. Um, Vice President Bush is now heading down toward the Cape. Uh, he is going with the acting administrator, Donald Graham. And uh, also we expect to find a little bit more about, hopefully a lot more about what happened coming up in a little less than an hour now at 3.30 Eastern time when NASA holds a news conference at the Kennedy Space Center at the Cape. Now back to Washington and, and Tom. Thanks, John Palmer. Uh, we've just been handed a press release by uh, something called Karun and Black in Space, Inc. That's a leading United States and International Satellite and Space Insurance Brokerage Firm, it announced today earlier that it had donated a personal accident insurance policy to Sharon Krista McAuliffe, Krista McAuliffe, the high school teacher who will be the first private citizen to fly aboard the shuttle. The policy provides $1 million of coverage and includes all of McAuliffe's activities while she is riding as a passenger aboard the Orbiter Challenger on this mission. That was donated before the launch of today's flight. The launch that was tragically witnessed by Krista McAuliffe's husband, her two children, and her parents. Steve Delaney is at the Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral, Florida, where George Bush and, and uh, the acting administrator of NASA will be headed under President Reagan's directions. Steve? Apparently, we're having some audio difficulties, uh, of course, uh, with Steve Delaney, who's at the Cape. We want to just uh, bring you up to date on what is likely to happen. We're going to have continuing coverage here on NBC News until this story is resolved in one form or another, and then we'll continue our coverage even after that. President Reagan has scheduled a special address to the nation tonight from the Oval Office directly. There has been a postponement of the State of the Union speech, which was scheduled before a joint session of Congress at 9 o'clock tonight, now postponed for one full week. As the enormity of this tragedy begins to unfold, really for all of us, uh, individually and collectively. The tragedy begins to uh, really deepen and to have the effect that any kind of tragedy of this sort has on all of us because we are bound together in so many ways by the space program and in a way I suppose that all of us were riding with Krista McAuliffe today. And now let's go back to uh, the Kennedy Space Center and Steve Delaney. Steve? Yes, Tom. Uh, when Vice President Bush was, uh, was first elected, was first in office in early in 1981, I came down here with him to, uh, to watch him go through a guided tour of the Columbia Space Shuttle, which was the first one to fly, had not yet flown. And he, he was met by astronauts Young and Crippen, who were the first crew, and they took him all over the thing. They walked him up the ramps and they took him inside the control compartments and they showed him the surfaces and explained to him what they were going to do. He's been closely associated with the space program ever since then and, and was the one government official not too many months ago who was presiding over the ceremony in which Krista McAuliffe was selected as the, the first teacher to go into space, the first civilian, really, to go into space. 
Mr. Bush will be coming down here with a, with a heavy burden. He will be the one who will try to convey the nation's condolences, the nation's sympathies on the loss of the crew, not only to the McAuliffe family, but to the families of the other astronauts who were here. Several of them were staying around town, and, and uh, they together, because the crew composed seven, seven different people, were, were quite a sizable contingent of family, well-wishers, close relatives, not so close relatives in some cases. Some of the, some of the flyers on this uh, group had extensive families, and a lot of them were here. But the vice president will come down. He will be uh, one of those who will try in an official way to express his, his sympathy, the president's, the kinds of feelings that have caused the delay in the State of the Union message, which was scheduled for tonight. The, officially, the United States government is putting aside its business in a way so that uh, through the offices of the vice president and his, uh, his associates who will be coming with him, they can try to, to ease the burdens and ease the pains of those who have, who have felt this loss. It is not one of the, the, the brighter uh, facets of the job of being vice president, but it's that sort of duty that falls on one, on one from time to time. So he'll be here later. And, um, I'm sure that he'll be closeted in private with the uh, with the survivors, the, the families of today's crew. Tom? Thanks very much. Steve Delaney at the Kennedy Space Center will ask you to stand by there, of course, until we get any kind of an official word. And we do expect in about 45 minutes from now that NASA will have a press briefing at the uh, Cape Canaveral at the Kennedy Space Center there. With me now is Norman Baker. He's the editor of Defense Daily here in Washington, which is a publication of Space Publications Incorporated. This is obviously a great tragedy for the families of the astronauts that are involved and for the space program as well. Wouldn't you think that we'll have serious, enormous delays that we can't even foresee at this time in the space program, both politically and technologically and financially? Well, yes, Tom, it's really hard to imagine what effect it's going to have on it because, first off, this is the first major setback, truly major setback that the space program has had since its inception. We did have that Apollo 1 fire in which three astronauts were killed while they were testing the spacecraft on the ground. But all along, we have felt that this shuttle was designed with a reliability factor that we could actually set it up almost as an airliner. This is why we had all the civilians going aboard. And I think it has really set in a state of shock for the space program to realize that we had forgotten, really, how dangerous the program really could be. You think that it was a mistake for NASA to have put civilians on board as early as they have? No, I really don't think so, although a one failure out of 25 launches is not a very good reliability. There's something drastically wrong here, and it's going to take some time, I'm afraid, to find out what went wrong. And it was just two launches ago that we had some other indications of trouble with the main engine, remember? when exactly. they When it shut down automatically, and they thought that they may have to make a quick return? Well, yes, and you know, there's so many factors here, so many parts that can go wrong. And I'm afraid it's not going to be one of those flights where we find out what went wrong with this one and we go on with the next one. I think there's going to be a lot of questions raised politically by the Congress of the United States and by the American people. Uh, is this thing really a reliable system? Or we, you know, do we want to go on with this until we can find maybe a better system? Mr. Baker, that spacecraft cost $1.2 billion to build. It probably will cost given the way things go here, about a billion and a half to replace of some kind. This is a country that's operating under almost austerity conditions in terms of the federal government. Yes, this is true. Well, also, it takes one-fourth of the space shuttle program out of existence. There's only four of those spacecraft. And we may decide that this is the time to start looking at the follow-on manned spaceflight program. I don't think anyone is going to suggest that we stop the space program. I don't think they're going to suggest that we stop the manned spaceflight program, but they're going to have to reorient this program. Uh, one thing that most people haven't talked about yet is the, the our entire space program, the military as well as civilian, was going to depend on that space shuttle. Yeah, you know, we had all of our eggs in that basket. All the eggs, including our Star Wars, our strategic defense initiative was going to plan on that. Which is the next point that I want to raise. Don't you think that the critics of President Reagan's SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, the Star Wars program, will now have an open book from which they can criticize the president's plans to put that kind of a space defense out there? Well, they will have a, a position here. They, they, they can criticize it because it's like any, uh, anything that's on the edge of technology. Something can go wrong. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't think, though, that this will really stand up because, uh, as I say, we have to go ahead. Remember, the Soviet Union is developing a space shuttle of their own. It looks almost exactly like this space shuttle. And uh, will they stop? I don't think so. Uh, it, it's just going to require a, a real close examination 
of how we're going into space. And uh, we're going to have to shift, for instance, the Defense Department will probably have to shift back to expendable vehicles until this problem is solved so that we can keep our security programs going. Do you know whether the uh, Defense Department has some uh, crucial missions planned for its own uh, part of the space shuttle program that will now ha obviously have to be deferred? It'll all depend on how long it is delayed. Well, they definitely had some very high priority programs planned. There's no question about that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they also had anticipated there would be problems with the space shuttle program or in either in scheduling or reliability problems because they set up their own expendable launch vehicle program, which is now going through Congress getting approved. I'm sure they'll accelerate that so that they can continue with their particular spacecraft. Mr. Baker, thanks very much for joining us today. Certainly, thank you. All right, uh, the uh, editor-in-chief of uh, Defense Daily, that's a publication of Space Publications Incorporated, talking about the cold, hard political and economic realities now of the space program in the United States as a result of this tragedy today. John Palmer, Studio 3K in New York. John? Thanks, Tom. Uh, you have raised there, and all day questions have been raised uh, about what happened, certainly primary uh, focal point, uh, the fate of the seven people aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger. What happened? Why did it explode a minute and 15 seconds? Well, a lot of these questions, all of these questions, are going to be put to NASA administrators and associates uh, down at Cape Canaveral less than an hour from now at 3.30 Eastern Time when they will hold a news conference and at least answer all the questions they can at that, uh, that particular time. Earlier this month on the NBC Today program, Bryant Gumbel interviewed Krista McAuliffe, the private citizen astronaut aboard the space shuttle, the, the first private citizen and a teacher. Uh, they talked about uh, how she felt and so forth. We have that tape now. We'd like to show it to you. It begins with the ceremony and remarks from Vice President George Bush when he announced that uh, she was going to be the first private citizen to go up on the shuttle. And the winner, the teacher who will be going into space, Krista McAuliffe. Where is that you? <laughs> Krista teaches in Concord High School in Concord, New Hampshire. She teaches high school uh, social studies. She's been teaching for 12 years. She plans to keep a journal of her experiences in space. It's, it's not often that a teacher is at a loss for words. I know my students wouldn't think so. I've made nine wonderful friends over the last two weeks. And when that shuttle goes, they might be one body. <laughs> but there's going to be ten souls that I'm taking with me. Thank you. Those ten souls, of course, belong to Krista and the nine other finalists who competed for that one special seat reserved for a teacher on next January shuttle flight. Krista McAuliffe has joined us here this morning. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Brian. Simple question. Why you? <laughs> It's really hard to say. There were 10 people. We were such a cohesive group, enthusiastic, really enjoying teaching, and I think any one of us would have done a really good job. I don't know what put me over the top, but I'm delighted to be here. When you first applied for this, did you think you had even a prayer? I really didn't. I was almost doing it kind of like when you play the lottery. Uh -huh. If you don't play it, you don't win. Sure. And when I filled out that application, that's really how I felt. I figured there'd be at least 50,000 people across the country who would be slipping that into the mailbox <laughs> around the same time. What about when you made it down to the last 10? Did you think then, maybe? Well, then the possibility became very real. And I really started to think what the impact would be on my teaching career and on my family. Yeah. But it was still really exciting. <laughs> Has it all hit you yet? No, no, I don't think so. I still can't believe that I'm going to actually be going into that shuttle. It just, it, it just really doesn't seem possible. Maybe when I'm on the launch pad it will. What are you most excited about? Seeing the Earth from that perspective of, of that small planet, you know, it, it's such a big place here, but being able to look at it from a new perspective, and I hope I can bring that wonder and that excitement back to the students. Maybe just a little bit of, of fright, too? Not yet. Um, maybe when I'm strapped in and those rockets are going off underneath me, there will be. But space flight today really seems safe. Um, we had a good example of that when um, NASA shut down the last one through the computer because one of the backup systems wasn't working. Mm. You say it seems safe. A lot of people equate that with it also seems boring. Have you been one, <laughs> have you been one who followed NASA efforts all along, long before? Oh, the... yes. Oh, yes. I can remember watching the vanguards as they went like this, and I remember um, Alan Shepard's first suborbital flight, and it was mm. really thrilling. I read where you said you wanted to demystify space. In, in, uh, in, in plain talk, what does that mean? 
Well, we, we see the space program as a science or math or technological um, adventure right now. I want the students to get a little bit of ownership. I want them to feel that they're part of the space age because they're the future and their children or grandchildren are going to be pioneering that. Mm -hmm. So I really hope to bring an ordinary person's perspective to this. Have you heard from some of your students yet? Yes, I have. They've been dropping by the house. They've been sending me cards. They've been calling. That, that's been super. NASA, of course, has a selfish interest in all this. I mean, they want to build up public support for that's the true. huge outlays that are necessary to keep the program going. As part and parcel of being the first ordinary citizen, I mean, are you expected to be the ordinary speaker who's out there um, well, making speeches on NASA's behalf? That's going to come. Certainly will, but I, I'm also delighted that the teaching profession and students and um, the whole country is really going to benefit from this. We hopefully are going to know an awful lot more about what life is like aboard the shuttle. Yeah. You go up on January the uh, 22nd. That's of, what the, of, the date is, yes, Of 86, right now. And, and we're hoping that that'll, <laughs> that'll be met. What are you most concerned about between now and then? Well, probably just getting my life in order. I do have a family in Concord, New Hampshire, and I have to get them set. I also want to make sure my replacement in school mm. is going to be comfortable for next year. Any thoughts, however slight, that you might not measure up once it gets going? Well, one of the things that has been really surprising is all of the, the publicity. And I was saying to my husband the other night, it's almost like I'm reading about somebody else, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a dream come true for you. Oh, it certainly is. Krista McAuliffe, congratulations. Thank you again. Good luck. We'll see you in January. Thank you. We'll take a break here. This is today. The first private citizen astronaut, Krista McAuliffe, there in an interview, a tape-recorded interview with Bryant Gumbel on the Today Show some weeks ago, talking about how proud she was to have been chosen to be a part of this space uh, shot, this tragedy. It's all but now impossible uh, to think that she could have uh, really survived uh, the, the crash today, the explosion of the space shuttle Challenger, along with six of the astronauts, seven altogether aboard the shuttle. Let's go back now to Washington and Tom Brokaw. John, it was such a poign poignant interview. You can see why she was so appealing and attractive to NASA. She was uh, outgoing and enthusiastic, and of course she talked with great enthusiasm about the confidence that she had in the space agency itself. Today, that moment of triumph came for her and ended very shortly after liftoff, about one minute and 15 seconds, that enormous explosion, and as you indicated, no survivors. Uh, Krista McAuliffe and six other astronauts appear to have perished in that gigantic fireball about uh, five miles up in space, one minute and 15 seconds after liftoff today. Dan Molina is at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas now, where he's been keeping track of what information he can gather there. Dan? Tom, no new information. I must say, it seems so sad and strange to glance up at some of the information readouts that we get from NASA here. There's an indication, MET, Mission Elapsed Time. That's the time that the mission would have lasted had it gone on. Oh, you can see it on your screen there. Three minutes, 12, three hours, 12 minutes, 16, 17, 18 seconds. That's the amount of time that the mission would have lasted had it not ended in the terrible, terrible tragedy this morning. And I must echo John's observation, it seems all but impossible now to look back to this morning when we were talking about ice problems, little problems, something that NASA has been so cautious about, little problems all the way along the line. And this morning, though, it looked like those little problems were going to be overcome. We saw a very happy crew first thing this morning. You just saw Krista McAuliffe. There's the crew with their traditional breakfast, the cake in front of them. Everybody ready to go this morning. They had glitches along the line, but this morning there was that attitude like today we were going to get off the launch pad. We're ready to go. NASA is ready to go. We had an extra hour of sleep, I know they were thinking. They uh, were delayed about an hour because there was a problem with an electronic fire detector that was on the pad itself. No indication that that electronic problem had anything to do with the accident today. There is Krista McCullough parading out with her fellow crew members, Ellie Onizuka giving a wave as they go into the elevator that would take them to the van that would then take, to, take them out to the launch pad. Seven members on this crew, a very experienced crew, being, apl being applauded there, Dick Scobie leading the way, mission commander, Judy Resnick behind him, Ron McNair, Mike Smith, all of them headed out to the launch pad, confident that today would be the day. We're going to go, they said earlier on today, headed for the van that would take them out to the launch pad. It was a very, very clear, very, very cold morning at the Cape today. We were talking about ice problems earlier on. There was the chance if they lifted off with icicles around the shuttle that one of those icicles might break off and damage the heat protection tiles. That would pose a hazard to re-entry. And so they were worried about that. They delayed about, uh, 
because of that problem for some time. But uh, there is, again, no connection between anything that could have resulted from that and the tragedy today. This is Krista McCullough putting on a vest that is full of life-preserving equipment should the shuttle land on the water. There is always that contingency that they plan for, as they plan for any number of them. That uh, vest has a life preserver in it that could keep an astronaut afloat for some 24 hours, food and things like that. That's one of the contingencies that they plan for. There are ways that they can get out of that hatch and swing down into the water if, in fact, they were to land on the water. That contingency is one of several, as I say, that NASA plans for, for including the uh, landing at one of several overseas landing sites. We were all very aware of the possibility of that some missions ago when they sensor indicated that a main engine had shut down on the shuttle. It turned out that it was the sensor's fault, not the engine's fault. Everybody was very scared about that, and we became very aware at that point of the possibility of something serious happening to the shuttle. People who are close to the program, astronauts all the time, say something's going to happen serious one day. But as you have pointed out, Tom, so many times this morning, and as so many observers have pointed out, it's become part of our lives. How could something happen to something that's as fun and as glamorous as the space shuttle? Well, today, obviously, it did a tragedy of enormous proportions, Tom. Thank you very much, Dan Molina. Um, as we indicated uh, recently, there have, there's been a lot of attention about journalists going into space. Walter Cronkite appearing in space regalia on the front page of some newspapers and in magazines as well. Any number of us have applied to NASA to a special screening committee that they have organized to see if we could be the first journalist to go into space as well. Obviously, the future of the journalist in space program remains very much up in air as well, as well as the future of the space shuttle program. Someone who has watched all of this since the inception, an original member of the Wright Stuff Group, was Deke Slayton. You'll remember him, one of the original astronauts who could not fly because of a heart murmur, later was able to go into space, now involved in a private space enterprise, hopes to launch communication uh, satellites and others as well. He's with us now from Houston, Texas. Mr. Slayton, as you watch those videotape replays of what happened today, could you get any indication at all through the naked eye what may have gone wrong? No, not really. I could just speculate like everybody else. If I had to speculate, uh, I'd say it's probably a 90% probability of something with a main engine since they just did clearance to throttle up and usually things fail when you're in a transient state. Everything else is apparently stable. so. If I had a hazard a guess, I'd say that would be the high probability, but that could be totally wrong, and it'll take a lot of numbers crunching and data analysis to really sort it out. Given the enormity of that fireball and what appeared to be the devastating effect of that on all of the equipment that may have been on board, will we ever know, do you think? Well, that's a good question. There's a lot of telemetry available, of course, and that'll be available and to analyze from the records. and. Uh, Hopefully they'll sort out the precise cause, but we've had uh, similar situations before, obviously without crews on board, uh, where we didn't know the precise cause of an accident, and we did what we call a shotgun fix. We fix everything that could have caused it, and the system continues to work. We did that back in the Atlas program in Mercury. Uh, Mr. Slayton, we've all been talking about the space shuttle program as if it's a routine shuttle flight from Washington to New York, talking about putting not just congressmen and senators up, but now school teachers and maybe even journalists in the future. Has the, uh, have we all become too sanguine about what can happen in space with these enormously complex vehicles? Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, as I've noted many times earlier, NASA is a victim of its own successes here and people have begun to accept uh, anything that NASA does is guaranteed to work and fortunately it has up to this point but uh, all of us in the business recognize that it's still high technology and there's some risk associated with it and uh, sooner or later you're going to have a failure nobody ever built the perfect machine yet and the shuttle certainly isn't but it's still a very good machine I'm confident they'll sort the problem out and we'll press on with the with the program you learn from your mistakes I'm not asking you to be unduly critical of your old agency, but do you think that NASA was too public relations oriented in getting civilians to fly on the uh, shuttle? Well, my opinion has always been nobody should ever fly in a space flight that doesn't have a good reason to be on. It's still not at the stage where you're going to haul people along for a joyride. It's not for me to evaluate the importance of each crew member on each flight. And uh, certainly there's some merit in having a teacher on board this one in terms of fostering education in the country, particularly the uh, science and technology related education, and so it's not for me to judge whether that was worth the sacrifice or not. That'll take history to do that.
Yeah. But I, I don't believe anybody should go that doesn't have a good solid reason to be there. You're a kind of competitor of NASA now. You're involved with a private program that hopes to launch its uh, own set of satellites uh, from private enterprise and so on. Do you think that the United States has invested too much of its space resources in the shuttle program? That, that is, that we've got too many eggs in that one basket? Well, no, not really. We're, we're not uh, a competitor in a very strong sense. We're dealing in a different segment of the market, but uh, as far as the bigger uh, payloads are concerned, uh, that, that is true. The, the country has made a big investment in the shuttle, and that's considered to be the wave of the uh, future, primarily because uh, one envisioned being a reusable system that would be cheaper and more economic, and obviously things will happen in space faster if transportation up there is cheap. Uh, but uh, there is a potential single point failure there if this turns out to be a generic type problem that requires shutting the whole fleet down for a year or so, which is not impossible, uh, you know, we'll have a serious problem. And I think uh, it probably would be wise to have a backup capability in this country, a launch capability, and that's what the old expendables, which are considered obsolete, can still provide you for many, many missions. So I still think the country needs to carry an expendable capability along with the great things the shuttle can do. What was your immediate reaction, Dick Slayton, when you saw that videotape of the explosion today? Personal? Well, I was. Uh, it caught me uh, not totally by surprise because I knew the, the thing had happened. So I, I was just looking to try to detect, if possible, what might have failed at what point. And uh, that was my prime interest in watching it. Did you know any Certainly of the astronauts on board? Pleasant sight. Did you know any of the astronauts on board? Oh yeah, I knew them all. Yeah, I worked with them. Uh, and knew them all very well. And you've been at this business a long, long time, both as a pilot and as an astronaut. Do you ever, ever get in a mindset that you can deal with the emotional impact of something like this? Well, sure. I've been doing it for about uh, 45 years, so you, you don't ever get to the point where you enjoy it, but uh, you got to learn to cope, and this is what goes with progress. Flight has always been a risky business. It'll always be risky particularly the uh, front end of it. And uh, some things go wrong, nobody has any control over, and when it happens, you've had a bad day, and you press on and make the best of it. And unfortunately, that's what happened here. But we'll learn from the problem and fix it and get on with it. Dick Slayton in Houston, thanks very much for being with us today. Thank you. I, I want to remind all of you that uh, some stations now may want to cut away from our continuing coverage of this tragedy, the explosion on board the shuttle challenger today you may want to return for your local programming however nbc news will continue its continuous coverage of this national tragedy here today and what we want to do now is show you once again what happened today in the skies over florida just out over the atlantic ocean at about one minute and 15 seconds after a liftoff of the space shuttle challenger with seven people on board Four, three two one and liftoff Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. Engines beginning throttling down now at 94%. Normal throttles uh, for most of the flight, 104%. We'll throttle down to 65% uh, shortly. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Velocity, 2,257 feet per second. Altitude, 4.3 nautical miles. Downrange distance, three nautical miles. Throttling up, three engines now at 104 percent. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, nine nautical miles. Downrange distance, seven nautical miles. Those are the parents, Ed and Grace Korg, and the parents of Krista McAuliffe. It appears at this point they don't know what has happened, but others, of course, realize that something seriously has gone wrong.
in slow motion now. To my eye, at least, it appears that the entire external tank just came apart and became one gigantic fireball. It would have been, at that point, a bomb. To the right, you see the solid rocket booster peeling off. It appears that it was that big fuel tank that we see attached to it, the largest part of the, of the shuttle program, that uh, just seemed to come apart. And, of course, it is chock-a-block with uh, volatile oxygen and hydrogen to fuel the main engines. The parents, Ed and Grace Corrigan, as they were watching that, didn't quite know what to believe as we looked at them. And, of course, this was their first launch, and as they looked at it, it appeared that there may have been a second booster going off one kind or another. But, unfortunately, that was not the case at all. In Concord, New Hampshire, where Krista McAuliffe was a school teacher, the entire community was involved, as you might expect.